With your Working Virginia update, I'm Doug Cunningham. Just before November's statewide election, the Virginia State Board of Elections is busy purging votes from the registration list. Tram Nguyen of Virginia New Majority says maintaining good voter lists is important. But I think that what the State Board of Elections in Virginia is doing with the, the voter purge is, is ill-advised. I think the timing is, is horrible, especially in light of the statewide election that's coming up. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, if we're going to be removing voters from the voter file, then let's make sure that safeguards are put in place so that qualified voters aren't inadvertently removed. Chesterfield County's registrar will not purge any voters until after the election, citing a 20 percent error rate in the purge lists the county has seen so far. Working Virginia Update, produced by Workers Independent News. I'm Doug Cunningham. This update made possible by the Office and Professional Employees International Union, ensuring fair treatment, fair wages, and benefits for thousands of working Virginians. Online at opeiu.org. Care to hear a mind-blowing fact about your chances of being arrested this year? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. In 2011, the last year for which statistics are available, for every 100 people in America, four, four were arrested in one year. This data was recently reported in the Huffington Post and came from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. More people are arrested on alleged drug offenses than for any other crime. And though blacks and whites use drugs and sell them at about the same rate, blacks are arrested at a rate four times greater than whites. Since 1980, as reported by Michelle Alexander in her book The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, the number of people in prison for drug offenses since 1980 has increased by over 1,000 percent. And get this. The majority of people in prison are not locked up for serious offenses, not for crimes of violence, not for selling drugs, not for having a long previous record. Of course, being arrested does not mean you'll end up with a conviction or in prison. But an arrest can cost you housing, credit, a professional license, a visa, and for sure, a job. Arrest is the entry point into the perverted, unjust, racist world of criminal justice. And mass incarceration is the unjust and obvious ultimate result. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. Packers. Vikings. We come from different places. Uptown. Downtown. We come to different conclusions. Half empty. Half full. But when we live united, we make a real difference in the building blocks of life. Children succeed in school. Families gain financial stability. The health of our neighbors improves and suddenly so do our communities. Real change won't happen without you. Live Live united. United. So give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. Sign up today at liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. You're listening to WIN, Workers Independent News, a production of Diversified Media Enterprises. I'm Doug Cunningham. Ohio is moving to expand Medicaid eligibility under the Affordable Care Act, but a legal challenge is expected. A state bipartisan budget committee voted to accept $2.56 billion in federal funds in order to bring more low-income Ohio residents into the Medicaid program. This move to expand Medicaid comes after Ohio's General Assembly failed to approve the expansion. Ohio Republican Governor John Kasich fought the right wing of his own party on the issue, and the General Assembly stripped out the Medicaid expansion from his budget proposal. Some Ohio politicians question whether this move is constitutional, so there could be a legal challenge. A third poll is showing U.S. House Republican incumbents are in trouble over the federal government shutdown. The most recent public policy polling survey of 25 GOP-held districts shows the Republican incumbents trailing generic Democrat opponents in 15 of them. Combining the results of all three recent polls, Republican incumbents in 37 GOP-held districts trailed Democrats in the polls. Democrats need a net gain of 17 seats to win control of the U.S. House in 2014. Recent Pew Research and NBC Wall Street Journal polls also show Republicans have been badly damaged by the government shutdown. American taxpayers are spending $7 billion a year paying to supplement the low wages of fast food workers. That's according to reports by Berkeley researchers in the National Law Employment Project. U.S. Senator Tom Harkin says the multi-billion dollar fast food companies are paying poverty wages and forcing taxpayers to pick up the slack when workers turn to public assistance. Jersey City's mayor this week signed a city ordinance guaranteeing workers the right to earn paid sick days. More than 30,000 workers will no longer be without paid sick days thanks to the new city ordinance. The law takes effect next
next year for Jersey City workers at businesses that employ more than 10 people. San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Seattle, Portland, Oregon, New York City, and the state of Connecticut also have guaranteed paid sick day laws. Paid sick leave opponents are using the power of state legislatures to block municipal independence on the issue. Jesse Russell reports. With paid sick leave laws gaining momentum around the country, opponents are seeking to use state legislatures to restrict municipal rights. While states like Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Vermont move forward on progressive legislation that will provide workers with a minimum number of sick days per year, states like North Carolina and Pennsylvania are going in the opposite direction. Think Progress reports that Pennsylvania has introduced a bill in the House that would prevent municipalities from requiring employers to give workers vacation time or other forms of leave from employment, paid or unpaid, that is not required by federal or state law. In 2011, Wisconsin's Republican Governor Scott Walker passed legislation in his state that nullified Milwaukee's paid sick leave law. The state enacted a similar measure in 2005 under Democratic Governor Jim Doyle that restricted municipalities in Wisconsin from having a minimum wage higher than the state minimum. So far, eight states have passed anti-paid sick leave legislation, and all eight used bills modeled by the American Legislative Exchange Council. You've been listening to WIN, Workers Independent News. For more information, visit laborradio.org. American citizens everywhere are demanding and supporting speedy and complete action. Broadcasting from the We Act Radio Studios in Washington, D.C., heard live across the nation, this is Take Action News with David Schuster. Many of the world's great movements of thought and action have flowed from the work of a single man. There is work to be done. The state of our economy calls for action, bold and swift, and we will act. We will take action when action is required. Hello and welcome to Take Action News all weekend. I'm Carl Frisch. You can find more about me at carlfrisch.com. Uh, be sure to sign up for my email list and follow me on Facebook and Twitter at Carl Frisch, K A R L F R I S C H. Don't forget to connect with the show at takeactionnews.com. We've got Peter, Rachel, Troy, and Melissa on controls. And I ha- want to give a special shout out to our affiliate in Chicago, WCPT, Chicago's Progressive Talk. Now let's get on with the news. The troubled rollout of healthcare.gov, the website, has not improved over the past week, and proponents of Obamacare have joined critics to lambast the site's developers. Healthcare.gov is so riddled with glitches that the term glitch almost misrepresents the extent of the site's flaws, which are only compounded by a huge bottleneck due to overwhelming traffic. This week's congressional hearings focused on the contractors responsible for developing the site. California Congresswoman Anna Eshoo called out the site's subpar performance, suggesting that healthcare.gov has not been an unmanageable amount of strain. I represent Silicon Valley, and I uh, find this very hard to follow. This is the 21st century. It's 2013. There are thousands of websites that handle concurrent volumes (coughs) far larger than what healthcare.gov was faced with. You keep speaking about unexpected volumes, Ms. Campbell. Um, And uh, that really sticks in my craw, I have to tell you that. Because as I said, uh, there are thousands of websites that carry far more traffic. So I think that's really kind of a lame excuse. Amazon and eBay don't crash the week before Christmas And Pro Flowers doesn't crash on Valentine's Day. Indeed. In short, heavy traffic is a quote-unquote lame excuse. While just about everyone acknowledges the flaws in the healthcare.gov rollout, some were critical of these congressional proceedings. Prompted by a line of questioning about privacy concerns, New Jersey Congressman Frank Pallone called the hearings a quote, monkey court. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I started out in my opening statement saying there was no legitimacy to this hearing, and the last line of questioning certainly confirms that. Uh, HIPAA only applies when there's health information being provided. That's not in play here today. No health information uh, is required in the application process. And why is that? Because pre-existing conditions don't matter. 
So once again, here we have my Republican colleagues trying to scare everybody. Will the gentleman okay. yield? No, I will not yield to this monkey court or whatever this thing this is. Monkey court or not, Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey summed it up best when he said, quote, it's pretty clear that they're working on the glitches in Obamacare, the website that is, and it's pretty clear that we need a geek squad for the website, not a firing squad for the entire bill. In response to extensive technical difficulties, the administration has extended the deadline for the individual mandate by six weeks, giving people extra time to secure health care coverage before being fined. Unfortunately, the hearings didn't delve into the broader issue of government IT failures, with a uh, special report out last week showing that 96% of all government IT projects costing more than $10 million fail. One would have hoped that this subject, the root of the problem for healthcare.gov and government IT as a whole, would have been discussed. In other tech news, clean energy entrepreneur and progressive activist Tom Matzi live tweeted an off-the-record conversation between a reporter and a former NSA chief, Michael Hay uh, Hayden. Matzi broadcast this conversation from a seat on an Amtrak Acela train right behind Hayden. Later in the program, I'll be speaking with Tom Matzi about his Twitter exclusive. We'll be sure to ask him what the two talked about when Matzi was finally found out and the jig was up. Later in the program, we'll also talk to experts from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International to discuss a joint report suggesting that U.S. drone strikes could be classified as war crimes. And up next, the always witty Tina Dupuy will tell us about her latest column titled, quote, Read More Than This Headline. She'll have to tell me exactly what it is about since I only skimmed the headline. I guess I should read that over the break. In any case, stay tuned. We'll be back after this. <laughs> If you're planning to replace your social security card simply because you don't have it, you may not need to replace it at all. What's most important is that you remember your social security number. Remember during school how you memorized information and answers for tests? In the same way, you should memorize your social security number. Knowing your number is important, but having the card may not be. If you really do need to get a replacement card to show to an employer, it's easy to apply for a new one. Find out how at www.socialsecurity.gov slash SS number. Sergeant Michelle Garcia served meritoriously in Iraq and has the medals to prove it. Soon after leaving the Navy, Lieutenant Chris Scott found a job, a home, and started a family of his own. Corpsman Richard Stokely took the skills he learned in Vietnam and put them to good use as a paramedic. But soon after leaving the military, each of these veterans fell on hard times and faced homelessness. Even after Michelle lost all her savings, even after Chris wasn't able to pay his mortgage, and even after Richard battled alcoholism for years, they each reached out for help when they needed it most. A simple phone call put them in touch What's with a trained professional from the Department of Veterans Affairs. That call got Michelle a place to stay so she could afford one of her own, put Chris in touch with employment assistance, and found Richard a substance abuse program. These veterans are success stories not only for how they were able to help others while serving their country, but for how they were able to let others help them. If you know of or are a veteran in need, make the call. Hey there, Matthew Filipovich here, host of the creatively titled Matthew Filipovich Show, which, by the way, you can hear every single Saturday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. right here on 1480 a.m. We Act Radio. Now, I'm going to be honest with you people. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but... But I like talking to smart people, people who are smarter than me, some of the smartest, funniest, most badass progressives out there. People like Glenn Greenwald, Naomi Klein, Jane Uger of the Young Turks, Jamie Kilstein, Allison Kilkenny, Alan Grayson, Jeremy Scahill, Jim Hightower, and more. That's right, I said more. Don't believe me? Well, tune in to the Matthew Filipovich Show every single Saturday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. for some of the best in 
and liberal talk, news, comedy, and interviews right here on 1480 AM, We Act Radio. Friends, David Schuster here, and all of us at We Act Radio are so proud of our neighbors here in Southeast D.C., especially one of our partners, The Ark. The Ark is at 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast. It's the home to some of Washington's best, including the Washington Ballet, the Levine School of Music, Boys and Girls Club, and the Children's Health Project all provide a number of programs and services within the very same facility. The Ark is also home to the Ark Theater, the only theater east of the river, which hosts a variety of dance, music, and theatrical shows each year. Almost everything you could want is at the Ark, so stop by and see them. The Ark, 1901 Mississippi Avenue in Southeast. For more information, visit the Ark's website, www.thearkdc.org. Or call 202-889-5901. The Ark, part of Southeast D.C. Welcome back. This is Take Action News. All weekend, I'm Carl Frisch. So, uh, I have no doubt in my head that when this interview is posted on the internet, somebody is going to post a comment without reading uh, anything about the interview or listening to the interview or watching the video on YouTube, they're going to post a comment uh, about how much they disagree with us without even listening. Um, and that's kind of the premise of our next guest's uh, column this week, titled Read More Than This Headline, asking us to dig a little bit deeper before we make assumptions. Tina Dupuy, the nationally syndicated columnist, joins us now to talk about her piece out today. Uh, Tina, thanks for joining us. Hi, Carl. Thanks for having me. So, uh, you, you no doubt, as a writer, have experienced uh, the folks, the comment trolls who see a headline, perhaps this is something about what's really wrong with Obamacare, uh, and they swing by to post a comment about how much they like the author without having read it. Uh, it turns out the article says what's really wrong with Obamacare is that it's not single payer. They didn't even bother reading. So, uh, tell us about your piece this week. Well, you know, and also a lot of times uh, I'm in a you know over a hundred newspapers, and a lot of times the uh, the editors write the headlines. Uh, right. I, I don't write my own headlines. I, I write a headline, and sometimes they go with that, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> but I get a lot of email about people going, you know, well, first off, that headline was stupid, and I'm, you're like, okay, well, um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, um, I'm sorry that your local editor headline, changed and it. And you're like, okay, yeah. well, you you probably want to read more than uh, just that um you know the, like we basically can have more information than just tweets i really believe we can <laughs> um but my piece is about you know if you were just to skim the headlines and a lot of right. us uh do that um you would think that the the new pope is a hippie and the new president of iran uh is a peacenik oh come on you're yeah. saying that pope francis isn't a hippie i mean i heard he drives an old car and lives in a modest apartment tina Right, exactly. So he's dropped the uh, traditional <laughs> papal bling, but uh, everything else, he's really, you know, this is a, a seventeen or 1,700-year-old torch that he's really, uh, he's been carrying uh, unabated, right? So you have, uh, he is not for gay rights. He's actually against gay rights. Um, he is not uh, for abortion. He's against abortion. He's uh, against birth control. Uh, he's against women serving um, as priests. Uh, you know, I mean, he is uh, also... He's against, against removing celibacy? Mary. Right. So, you know, and yeah, he's for priests being celibate. I Are you trying to make the argument that what's more important than style is substance? Because, you know, that just seems foreign to the media. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. I am the I am the champion of lost causes. Well, I mean, it's like the Pope ditches the... would be one. The Pope ditches the Prada loafers. But it's not like he started selling off gold assets of the papacy, of the, the church. To feed poor people. You got it. He may not live um, in the last residence of the last pope, but the church still owns it. But he's not renting it out to homeless people. <laughs> right. Uh, and furthermore, furthermore, as much as he says we should be focusing more, and I'll give him credit for you know some of the stylistic changes, sure. But whenever I hear somebody bragging about how much more liberal this pope is, I remind them that no changes have been made to any church teachings. 
Um, that right. means that everything that you may have found... Obje- it, what makes you a reformer is reform. Right. Not just style. And I think one goes hand in hand with the other. Um, and, it, you know, it's been interesting is to watch, uh, you know, regardless of the, the lack of changes, um, what's been interesting to watch is the American bishops, who are extremely right wing, bending over backwards to impress upon their flock that there has been no change in the church, um, even though the pope is talking differently. Just because Jane Fonda is like, this guy is great, right. uh, doesn't mean that he's liberal. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's been kind of interesting to watch that, um, but you know, but it's just it's just not uh, deserved press. I'm sorry. It's just you know he is who he is who he is, um, and that has not changed. Uh, the church is, uh, hasn't changed. I mean, you, you still go. I mean, I've traveled in South America where the church, where the Pope uh, is now is from, and you know, you you go to these third world countries where you know there are people who are you know, who are living in poverty. I mean, they are starving, living in poverty, living below any poverty line that we could possibly fathom in this country. And then you go into the cathedrals and, you know, it's uh, 12 feet high and made out of Inca gold. Uh, You know, I mean, the contrast is stark. uh, And, you know, and there there are a lot of them are of the um, the same uh, Italian descent as the Pope. Uh, That has not changed. Uh, You know, I... I don't want to, you know, I mean, I, I'm grateful that he's talking about poverty issues because I feel that that is something that the, the church is really not, um, has omitted from really being a, a doctrine um, in the forefront of what they talk about. But at the end of the and day... And that's, you know, it is important to stress that, that, you know, the church does a lot for the poor, um, but when they don't make that the driving force of their message... It sends a message to their flock that other issues are more important, like abortion and like gay people. So when you have bishops in the United States saying that they would deny communion to Catholics who are pro-choice or pro-marriage equality and not and not hang on, uh, hang on a second, Tina, and not denying communion to Catholics who are in Congress and support wars that the church is against or support cuts to funding like the SNAP program, the food stamps program that the church is against, it really sends a message to your flock that certain issues are more important than the other. Absolutely. I mean, we're talking about the same church that, uh, you know, the, there is an ecclesiastical court that um, that went after John Kerry for being pro-choice when he was running right. for uh, president. You know, I mean, this, this is like, and this has not changed. Um, the, you know, the framing is a little bit different, but like you put a, like a, a smiley face to uh, a secretive um, regime, it's the same secretive regime, and that's why in this piece I also talk about the new president of Iran. It's his, it's right. his first hundred days in office. But Tina, he's on uh, Twitter. He's hip. What? He's cool. Right. Yeah. Exactly. No. He he uh, he almost shook hands with President Obama. They uh, Tina, I don't know if you know this, but he accepts that the Holocaust might have happened. Um, see, that's the thing. He didn't actually say that. He kind of <laughs> right. On that. He, he said he wasn't a historian, and I'm like, either am I. The Holocaust happened. Tina, I'm not a scientist. Exactly that you I can't do. tell you why when I fall down I hit the ground. Could be gravity, exactly. could be something else. Gravity is just a theory. Right, exactly. Like, he really waffled on that, but the headlines, again, the headlines were like, you know, the Holocaust happened, says new president of Iran, and it's like, no, that's not actually what he said. He's been in office now 100 days. These are like the flowers that a these are like the flowers that a spouse abuser gives to their their mate uh, yeah, to get exactly. welcomed back but inside. So he's been in he's been in office a hundred days, and you've had and there are estimates that there's been upwards of somewhere between 130 and 250 executions in a hundred days. There's only 47 million people who live in Iran. This is not that big of a country. Uh, I mean that's and for us to like go oh, this guy you know it's like kumbaya. I mean he's he's a, a He's an insider. He, uh, you know, he might be a moderate. I think it's not earned um, that he, like, he came out when he was campaigning and said that he wanted to have a um, a citizen's uh, bill of rights, and uh, he wanted to uh, mend relationships with the West because they want sanctions to be lifted. But you have, you know, you have uh, Iranian police who are shooting and killing smugglers. In a country that has been suffering under sanctions. Well, and we're going to be talking. So women you know, are still being detained as we, for not wearing a headscarf. As we enter into these negotiations with Iran uh, to join the you know world of nations, 
Um, we'll be talking later in the show with Ben Armbruster from Think Progress about how the right wing is really going into overdrive to get to war with Iran before uh, yeah. <laughs> any peace can happen. Um, you know, one thing that occurs to me is that by giving these folks such credit for their um, rhetoric, we actually slow down the need for them to reform themselves, right? So if we know yeah. that the church is hemorrhaging members and losing money, not just because of the sex assault cases, but because they have trouble recruiting priests and nuns, uh, if we know that that's happening under current policy and the way that people currently feel about the church, when we give them credit for nothing more than lip service, we slow down the need for them to change. Same thing with Iran. Right. If they already get a passing grade, why would they then double down and actually do more homework? Right. Same thing with Iran. That's exactly right. It's a very good point. You're right. Um, it, it, you know, and this is not this is something that we also saw at the beginning of of 2013 with the Republican Congress. Right. It was um, the new Republicans, not your mom and dad's Republican Party. They're going to have to change so that they can win elections. And have they changed after even though they got two months of nothing but stories about Republicans 2.0 and how. Uh, you know, Eric Cantor was going to lead Republicans to, you know, being more acceptable to the American people. Did they change at all or did they try to drive us over a cliff? Uh, I think we all know the answer to that. Right. So we, we have a tendency, I guess the point I'm trying to underscore is the point you make in your column, which people can read at Tina Dupuy dot com, uh, D-U-P-U-Y, is that when we allow ourselves to be spun, when mm. when we allow the media to say uh, the Pope says this and that's a promising sign. He's a changer and a reformer without pointing. You can say that it's a promising sign, but do point out that no policy change has happened. You know, you can say that the Pope has eschewed the fancy shoes and the fancy apartment and everything else, but do point out that policies have not changed. Same thing with Iran. Right. Correct. And, you know, and also like, you know, I don't. Th I think this is just laziness on the media part. I think it's laziness to go like, I read that headline. Yeah, I kind of get the gist of it, uh, instead of actually being skeptical right. um, about what that means. And I, because I think at the end of the day, people really want reform in the in the Catholic Church. They want to see something different uh, than the the last few popes that we've had. Um, you know, the 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 church has been uh, rocked by scandal, and and children have, have been systematically abused in that church. I think we want to see that them kind of come into this century. Uh, same with Iran. I mean, we don't want to, we're tired of being at war. We want, uh, you know, the whole idea of having, you know, they, they had a, a revolution that never started there, right? You know, they, right. um, and or a revolution that, uh, that was kind of quashed. And so for them to like stand up and vote for the person who they were told were, is a moderate, um, who ran as a moderate, and for them to overwhelmingly vote for a man who ran as a moderate to then go, okay, he's not, he doesn't, he hasn't earned those that uh, moniker yet. Right. He hasn't like showed us that that's truly what he is. Uh, but we want that so much that we kind of fill in the gaps with, you know, fantasy um, and uh, omitting the parts that that really make those statements to be untrue. Um, I think that, like, at the end of the day, it, it, there are hopeful headlines, but I would like to see them be accurate headlines. It's like we get suckered, you know, the, the Beltway Press gets suckered into this groupthink mentality where they've got to parrot what everybody's, you know, what each of them is reporting. You know, if, if colleague X reports that the Pope has changed uh, and how great it is, then, then colleague Y is going to report the exact same thing. Right. No, and, and totally. And it gets into a, a, a frenzy where everyone says the same thing, and then, then if you say any different, then it's like, well, no, that's not accurate because this is what is going on over at this paper. And you're like, okay. Well, or you're not considered a serious person. I mean, it's kind of like the right. the zeitgeist around needs to cut Social Security and Medicare. One minute. If you don't believe that, then there are certain people in Washington, D.C., Beltway types, mostly reporters, that don't believe you're a serious person. Right. Yeah, they, that's that's true. And so the tastemakers kind of get, you know, you get discounted. Um, but, uh, and you know, and, and I also think that, uh, you know, I mean, this, this, this column that, are, you know, is really about, like, having follow-up questions, which is, you know, I, I made a joke about people kept on talking about the house stenographer, and I was like, oh, you mean that's not the press gallery? 
Right. No, I thought it was Michelle Bachman uh, being escorted off for her final time in the House of Representatives. But Tina, we're going to have to leave it there, and we'll have to pick this up uh, next week with you uh, when we see your next uh, great piece of work. This is Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch, and we'll be back after this. You're listening to Take Action News on We Act Radio, produced at the studios of WPWC, 1480 AM in Washington, D.C., your nation's capital. I had a sore in my mouth that just wouldn't go away. And after a couple of weeks, I went to my doctor. A sore, lump, or thick patch in your mouth or throat could be a symptom of oral cancer. My doctor told me I was smart to come in. He said that oral cancer is more common in African-American men than in any other group in the U.S. It turns out I did have oral cancer, but it was caught early and my treatment was successful. I'm glad I got it checked. That probably saved my life. If you're an African-American man, you need to know about oral cancer. Visit a doctor or dentist if you see changes in your mouth that don't go away after two weeks. It's important to get an oral cancer exam because if you do have cancer, the earlier it's caught, the better. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health. Jeff, I'm home. Hey, Mom. So, what did you do today? I noticed the dishes are still in the sink. I've been busy. Getting your taxes done like we talked about? Oh, I got my friend Dave on that. Hey, he's only charging 20 bucks. Not Dave from your high school class who graduated three years late. Yeah, he's good with numbers. Won our fantasy football league last year. Jeff, I can't believe you would actually take your- Kidding, Mom. I took all my paperwork over to that preparer just like you recommended. Using a paid tax preparer this year? Visit irs.gov for some do's and don'ts. Like, look for a preparer who has a preparer tax ID number and signs your return. Check out their qualifications and review your tax return before you sign it. Oh, Jeff, why do you do this to me? Mom, you're just so easy. (laughs) IRS.gov. It's the best tax tip of all. You know, this used to be a good neighborhood. Now it's a mess. You got all these polyps running around. (laughs) Colon cancer almost always starts with a polyp. Get the polyp early and stop colon cancer before it even starts. Where do you think you were running to, huh? I didn't even see you guys there. I was Get the test. Get the polyp. I want to talk to my lawyer! Get the cure. I got a phone call! CD is for everybody, not just for the few. Anyone can share. curious or confused, get information or a pamphlet at most pharmacies or a health clinic. If you need help, see a doctor. Would you like to secure stable employment, affordable, high-quality child care, or an opportunity to serve your community through meaningful volunteer and internship experiences? If so, UPO is the place for you. Hello, I'm Andrea Thomas, Vice President of Administration and Chief of Staff for UPO. As the Community Action Agency for Washington, D.C., UPO has proudly served the residents of Washington for the past 50 years. Annually, we impact the lives of nearly 100,000 Washingtonians, 100,000 people advancing their education, securing employment, maintaining housing stability, and investing in their communities through volunteerism. Our vision is a Washington of thriving communities and self-sufficient residents. To learn more about our services and how you can partner with us or donate, Visit us at www.upo.org. UPO, where we are uniting people with opportunity. Uh, Obviously, there are lots of developments happening in Iran. 
Um, and as talks continue between Iran and other P5 uh, world powers, Republican war hawks are clamoring to bring us into another confrontation with another Middle East country. Um, and in the case of one extreme GOP donor, who you'll remember, Sheldon Adelson, um, he wants us to drop a nuclear weapon, a nuclear bomb on Iran. Uh, meanwhile, the White House and Senate Democrats are discouraging further economic sanctions before this round of negotiations surrounding the country's nuclear program. This is all pro uh, progress on that front. Joining us to talk about what's going on there uh, and what these uh, right-wing uh, hawks are, are you know, trying to force uh, is National Security Editor for Think Progress, Ben Armbruster. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. So walk me through this. I mean, I'll, you know, we've been so focused on on the problems plaguing Washington's ability to, you know, to pursue legislative uh, accomplishments that a lot of the conversation around Syria and Iran and the huge developments that have happened over the last six months uh, with Iran um, have, you know, been largely ignored in the media. So bring us up to date. Iran has basically, you know, they've basically said that they want to be considered serious players who are willing to do certain things to have sanctions lifted um, and, you know, be considered polite company, essentially. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that um, the Obama administration has had more success in the last couple of months talking with the Iranians than they have Republicans in Congress. Right. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean you're right. I mean there's there's been there's definitely been been progress in in, in talks with the Iranians, and I think um, a, a large part of the reason why that is 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 well, a number of factors. One is the the international coalition that President Obama um, gathered together when he became president to push tougher sanctions on on Iran. Um, you know, giving this. Per, per, Providing this sort of um, um, the scene where the Iranians needed to come to the table to alleviate these sanctions, and now that they've elected this sort of relatively moderate president in Hassan Rouhani, you know, he came to power on, under the, you know, under this promise that he was going to, you know, to get these sanctions lifted, and 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 now that the Iranians are serious about you know, the negotiations, um, you know, they seem to be going somewhere. And at the same time, though, you have, um, you know, members of Congress, uh, particularly Republicans, but also right. some Democrats, um, who don't really seem to care all that much about what's going on in, in Geneva with, uh, you know, the, the negotiations. I mean, even though that they have been going quite well, and there, there seems to be some promise as to perhaps a final deal here in the future. Then how much of that has to do with maybe just uh, certain fractions of Americans' political establishment being so stuck in the way things have been for the last, gosh, what, 30 years um, that they can't see beyond it uh, in one aspect? And then the other aspect being, you know, the, the likes of people like Trent Frakes, who are, you know, uh, right wing evangelicals who believe that they can hasten uh, you know, Armageddon in the Middle East by, you know, going to war with Iran and thus bring Jesus back to bring us all to heaven. Yeah, I mean, I think that for the first part of your question, um, it doesn't matter to a lot of people whether Hassan Rouhani or Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is president of Iran, right? I mean, right. Iran Iranians are always, you know, evil and, and, and you know, only, only can only be met with four. So I think that there's part of that going on in Congress where, you know, they just don't care. Um, and then, I, and, you know, as far as Trent Franks goes, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, I think that Trent Franks doesn't really know what he's talking about in terms of <laughs> Iran. I mean, he said the other, and he's introducing, he wants to introduce, a, he's trying to shop, he's shopping on a bill for co-sponsors right now to a resolution to authorize war with Iran. And, you know, and he was saying the other day, he was just, he, he was asked to justify um, his resolution, and he said, "Well, look, I'm going to use hyperbole here. You know, the president <laughs> wants to the president wants to allow Iran to have nuclear weapons as long as they use them for peaceful purposes, and and that's just not true. You know, right. Obama has no intention of allowing Iran to have nuclear weapons. So. Well, that's just your opinion, Ben. Uh, I happen to know that our Kenyan Muslim leader um, is in cahoots with the Iranians. Hey." You know, that's, that might that might be on Trent Frank's radar. You never know. And meanwhile, you've got some very powerful players that might be playing in the, into this as well. Um, you know, if if part of the problem with 
uh, Republicans' inability to negotiate on things like the debt ceiling and a government shutdown uh, can be pinned on the powerful institutional players that bankroll their campaigns, not wanting them to give in. Certainly, people like Sheldon Adelson, who you know, uh, think Progress reported was at an event uh, about Iran and said that you know uh, we should drop a nuclear bomb on them. Certainly, his opinions are going to hold sway given how much money he invests in Republican campaigns. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a good point. Um, you know, he gives a lot of money to the Republican Party, and 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 another another sort of aspect of this story is that he also gives a lot of money to think tanks who are promoting these views. Um, and one one particular one think tank in particular is the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, which is a sort of neo conservative esque uh, think tank that's been pushing a hard line on Iran for years. And this and, and the Foundations on Defense of Democracies (FDD) has very very uh, significant influence on Capitol Hill, uh, particularly among lawmakers who are writing Iran sanctions bills. And they're the ones that are pushing this zero enrichment negotiating tactic, right? Yes. Uh, Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that? I mean, and why that's kind of, it's like a poison pill, frankly. It's a poison pill. Um, it, it's kind of a long story, but to kind of make it make it short, um, you know, a lot of experts um, have said that in order to get an agreement with Iran over its nuclear program, we're probably going to have to allow them some capabilities to enrich uranium. You can enrich uranium for, for two different purposes. One is for weapons and one is for civilian nuclear energy, right? And you enrich it to low levels for, you know, um, civilian energy purposes, whereas you enrich right. it to high levels for nuclear weapons. So, you know, the genie is already out of the bottle in terms of Iran enriching uranium. They've been doing it for years. Um, and I think in order for them to save face and, and getting a deal with the West, you know, I think that's going to probably be part of it. However, you know, there are hardliners here in the U.S. and in Israel who are saying, no, the Iranians will not have enrichment. They will not have any enrichment capabilities whatsoever, and we will never accept an agreement as such. Um, they won't be happy until we do go to war with Iran, right? It's right. kind of like it's kind of like the folks. I mean, these are basically the same folks that were just looking for a reason to go under Iraq in two thousand two. Exactly, and a lot of the people who are pushing this so-called zero enrichment plan, um, you know, have been calling for war with Iran for years. So, you know, they're not really interested in getting an agreement with Iran. They're interested in getting into a situation where Iran, you know, if you if you offer something, if you offer the Iranians something that they'll never that you know they'll never accept, then you can say, see, the Iranians don't accept our offers. Right. We'll have to go to war. But how much sway do these folks have, given how disastrously uh, Iraq and Afghanistan turned out for? the neocons. Um, I know they, I know these folks still have a lot of sway in the media. Um, you know, the fact that they were so utterly wrong on Iraq and Afghanistan uh, has not <laughs> kept the press from going to them for comment about world affairs. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't, re I don't really understand it. I mean, you see Bill Crystal on TV all the time. You see Senator Lindsey Graham on TV all the time talking about this stuff. Um, you know, uh, you see John Bolton on TV all the time talking. Is there about anything that. that somebody like Bill Crystal or confirmed bachelor Lindsey Graham could possibly say uh, that would keep the media from, you know, hanging on their every word when it comes to this stuff? Yeah, I, I, that's just what it is. I don't, I don't, I don't really understand why they, the media continues to turn to these people. And it's not like they couldn't find other conservatives to go to. Right. I mean, there's a there's a there's a huge contingent of conservatives and Republicans who are fighting this sort of war first mentality within the party. So, I mean, there's there's a clear I mean, it's clear that there there are alternatives, but I I don't I mean I don't understand why they're not going to other other people or or even progressives for that matter. Um, I mean, maybe it's just out of laziness. I don't I don't really know. Well, and it seems like there's three fractions now, right? There are the the war first people, there are the war never people the Rand Paul people in some fractions right. of the Democratic uh, left. And then there is the uh, maybe the more pragmatic center, um, which is most of the Democrats in Congress and uh, maybe a good chunk of Republicans. How much sway does that group have within the Republican Party? That's a good question. I think the Republican Party right now is in it 
it's, it's in a civil war, really. Um, right. Not only are they in a civil war in terms of domestic policy with Ted Cruz and and you know what's going on with the shutdown and Obamacare and all that sort of thing, but there's been a there's been a civil war within the Republican Party on on foreign policy for a long time, and you know it, it kind of came to a head during the 2012 campaign. Right. And I think it, it remains to be seen, you know, who's going to come out on top. I mean, obviously, history is not on the neocon side. Um, but I think, you know, a few elections down the road, we're going to see, you know, who holds the real power in the Republican Party. Well, and hopefully, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not with the Paul people necessarily. I'm not a, uh, uh, you know, a peacenik uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But hopefully that kind of influence in the Republican Party, along with enough of those people in that sensible center, will drag the party slowly away from this posture that war is always the answer. I mean, uh, that's, 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 a, that's a hope, you know, and I think as a progressive, you know, I think at the end of the day, we would, we would want that to happen, to push the Republican Party, um, you know, more towards a, a more pragmatic um, foreign policy. On the other hand, if they're going to fight about it for 10 years, I'm happy to hold the coat. <laughs> well, I think they've got, uh, you know, they're doing everything in their power to squander the institutional advantage that they built in through gerrymandering for themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was thinking in 2010 that they'd have the majority for the next 20 years. I'm beginning to think it's probably going to be gone in four years at this rate. Um, right. But uh, what what should folks be, in the minute we've got left, what should folks be watching for as these talks continue that they might have to look for since the media is not really covering this issue too closely? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, it's amazing how little attention this this Iran issue has gotten over the last few weeks, considering the breakthroughs and, and the positive talks and, and the construction. And of course, that'll be followed by, you know, the media navel gazing and saying how few Americans know where these places are on, a pla- on the globe. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess what you can look for, I mean, next week, um, there's going to be two big, two big news stories. One is um, the talks will resume um, in Geneva, the second round with, uh, with the Iranians and the P5 plus one. Um, and uh, we're going to see, we're going to find out whether the Senate is going to introduce a new round of sanctions. Um, that's been a big question. The Obama administration has been um, urging Congress to hold off on new sanctions while these new um, you know, positive talks kind of bear fruit. Um, there's a lot of people in Congress, obviously, that don't want to do that, but you know, the, the White House has been on the Hill making the case and they seem to have um, won the battle so far. So we'll see what happens next week when the, if the banking committee introduces its sanctions bill. I suspect I suspect they will not, um, but uh, I think that remains to be seen. Well, I, I certainly hope they give the president some room to breathe on this. I mean, uh, it was not that long ago, 2008, when the idea that this president would uh, work to bring some kind of a, uh, you know negotiating uh, peace to Iran. Um, was unthinkable, and now it's happening. Hopefully, they'll give him the space to make it happen. Ben Armbruster, the national security editor for Think Progress, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You can find him on Twitter at Benjamin J A. Uh, this is Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch, and when we come back, we're going to talk about a friend of mine eavesdropping on the. Say you want to go to college, a Big Ten college, but you don't want to feel like part of the, well, you know. Is there an answer for you? Of course. Indiana University East. Indiana University East. You'll get the quality of a Big Ten education in a small college setting. IU East offers more than 50 fields of study, from accounting to political science, taught by internationally recognized faculty with an average of 18 students per class. So it's not... Student number 95A-6273, please report to... It's more like... Hey, John, welcome to class. Best of all, you'll graduate with one of the most respected degrees anywhere, a degree from IU. Don't wait. Go to iue.edu... Or call 800-959-EAST to arrange a visit to Indiana University East. IU. Focused on you. I had a sore in my mouth that just wouldn't go away. Education beyond high school. A path to opportunity and success for our young people. The key to building a better life for themselves and ultimately their own children. But for many, all this is only a dream. 
because the challenge of paying for education beyond high school seems to put this opportunity out of reach. But there is an organization that can help. Each year, we award $80 billion in grants, low-interest loans, and work-study to students in colleges, trade schools, and professional schools. We are federal student aid, part of the U.S. Department of Education. You can learn more by logging on to federalstudentaid.ed.gov. We may be able to help you realize your dreams, so don't get left behind. After all, the most costly education is the one not begun. Federal Student Aid. Start here. Go further. Hey, Gatcha News is proud to be sponsored by Healthcare for America Now. HCAN is a national coalition of more than a thousand groups in 50 states representing 30 million people. HCAN works to promote, defend, implement, and improve the Affordable Care Act at both the state and federal levels. They also try to protect Medicare and Medicaid, increase corporate accountability, and confront forces that seek to take away critical services. HCAN believes in creating jobs, not cutting programs people depend on. HCAN runs comprehensive issue campaigns that mobilize people at the grassroots and define the public debate. HCAN is fighting to protect, implement, and improve the new health care law through national and state-based legislative and regulatory campaigns built on grassroots action, public education, communications, policy analysis, and groundbreaking research. HCAN has become a respected voice and national leader on health care while continuing to focus on aggressive field activity. Support HCAN, Healthcare for America Now. When you go on a road trip, you're careful. You follow the signs to arrive at the right place. It's the same online. Read the internet signs along the way, where you may be led astray. For example, look for the .gov at the end of the web address. If it isn't .gov, it isn't the real Social Security website. People are often victimized by misleading advertisers who use terms like Social Security or Medicare to trick the public. These companies charge a fee for free Social Security services. These services include changing your name and getting a new Social Security card. There's no need to pay for services Social Security offers for free. Go to www.socialsecurity.gov. And remember, if it isn't .gov, it isn't Social Security. This is Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch. So overheard on the Amtrak Acela, my good friend Tom Matsey was just sitting there. Uh, and um, he heard somebody He heard somebody talking. Uh, and that person that he heard talking was the former head of the NSA, Michael Hayden. So what happened next has really lit up the Twitter sphere, if that's even a word, uh, and the Internet in general. Um he started live tweeting uh, Michael Hayden's off the record conversation uh, with a member of the media, several members of the media, one call after another. And he kept on telling uh, these reporters, you can call me a senior administration official. So he was bad mouthing the administration off the record and trying or not off the record on background and trying to hide his identity by asking them to refer to him as a senior administration official. Um, he was talking about uh, the president's BlackBerry. You may remember being a story back in 2008. He was talking about uh, rendition and black sites. Um, he was talking about uh, the, you know, uh, all kinds of things when it comes to uh, national security, and he was doing it from an Amtrak Acela train uh, with an earshot of Tom Matzi, my good friend. Um, and no doubt others as well. Uh, joining us now to talk about his train ride to infamy, um, and then I actually want to do something that probably nobody's done thus far, and talk to him about issues far more important than his ability to eavesdrop on the head of the NSA, 
uh, global climate change and what he's doing to help combat it. Tom Matsey, thanks for joining us. Yeah. So, Tom, in a nutshell, explain to the, the audience at home what it was like when you realized that the person you were hearing talk about national security issues was Michael Hayden, what happened next, and, and then I want to talk about ethical electric because I think the issue of climate change is far more important uh, than, uh, you know, something as newsy uh, as this is. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm having a bad cell phone here. I apologize. But it was kind of shocking as soon as I realized what was going on. And I was really surprised. Um so then you started. Well, I'm so sorry. It's okay, Tom. So then you started posting tweets, and eventually, I'm sure you know you're saying he's trying to get himself identified as a national, uh, you know, a former uh, senior advisor to the president, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he was talking about issues X, Y, and Z, um, and then eventually uh, you were under the impression that perhaps you'd been made. <laughs> I guess that's the way to tell the story. Yeah, <laughs> I, I realized that he he might have. Uh, what was going on. Um, and, you know, I've seen pretty much every outlet that I can imagine has talked about this. Very few of them have uh, used it as an opportunity like you have. One of the things that I enjoyed about your Twitter feed, and people should follow you at Tom Matzi, M-A-T-Z-Z-I-E, um, is that you took the opportunity as, as thousands of people were finding out about your Twitter feed for the first time to push an issue that it's far more important, frankly, uh, climate change. Um, and to let it be known that while they're all interested in this salaciousness of, you know, the newsy, sex, sexy story value of the former head of the NSA being eavesdropped on on a train, and while it's all finding good to point out the, the story that underlies that, that there are far more important things that the media should be covering uh, and talking about as well, and that's climate change. You run a company called Ethical Electric. I am a subscriber of Ethical Electric. Uh, why don't you tell folks about it and how they can sign up too? You know, we're a 100% renewable energy company. When you sign up for us, you pay your power bill. We bought, we uh, send that money to wind farms, so you don't have to spend any you know, different kind of than what you're spending right now. Uh, you still get a bill every month from your utility, but when you pay it, you're able to support uh, you know renewable energy instead of dirty energy. Well, and then uh, you all do something interesting with the profits as well, right? Oh, yes, that's right. We share 1% of, not just profits, 1% of gross revenue. Revenue. So even if we're not profitable, we share money with uh, causes our customers care about, which we think we'll be able to announce our first grants this coming January. It's fantastic news. Did you Have you learned anything um, over the last uh, 24 hours that you didn't know already about the way that the Beltway operates? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, I <except laughs> that... Um, I probably need better cell phone batteries. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Tom, uh, I, I want to thank you for uh, joining us um, during what has probably been a busy uh, 24 hours for you as you've uh, made all sorts of media appearances. Uh, folks should follow you on Twitter. That's Tom Matzi, M-A-T-Z-Z-I-E. Um, and they should go to Ethical Electric uh, it, online. They can Google it, uh, ethicalelectric.com, right? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, you know, I signed up uh, not long after you guys launched. Um, so for nearly a year, um, I've, uh, you know, all of the electricity that my apartment uses has been coming from clean, uh, renewable sources. Yeah. Um, and that's something that just wasn't possible for me. And I didn't have to, you know, do much. I just had to, to sign up and I continue to pay my Pepco bill. And, and there you have it. Um, yeah. it's, it's really a good step in the right direction. Tom Matsey, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. All righty. That was Tom Matsey. Uh, Google him and read the stories. I mean, you can read it in New York Magazine. You can read it uh, at The Guardian, Huffington Post, CNN, NBC. It's been everywhere. Um, and uh, you'd be surprised the types of people you could run into on the Acela train in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, not too long ago, uh, five short years ago, you'd be likely to run into the current vice president of the United States on a regular basis who used the Amtrak every single day. Uh, this is Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch. And in the next hour, we're going to talk about 10 folks who were fired for screwing up on Twitter. <laughs> Don't miss it. We'll be right back.
I'm Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico. Last year, my state became the 12th state to allow medical use of marijuana by patients who are seriously ill. Some people were surprised that a Republican governor supports medical marijuana, but I'm hardly alone. Groups like the American College of Physicians, American Nurses Association, and American Public Health Association have all acknowledged the medical value of marijuana. New research about medical marijuana is coming out almost every day, showing remarkable potential in all sorts of serious conditions, including cancer, AIDS, and chronic pain. But some in government still want to put politics and ideology ahead of public health. To learn more about medical marijuana and what you can do to help, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thanks. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC 1480 AM, broadcasting live from Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue in D.C. You're listening to WIN, Workers Independent News, a production of Diversified Media Enterprises. I'm Doug Cunningham. Ohio is moving to expand Medicaid eligibility under the Affordable Care Act, but a legal challenge is expected. A state bipartisan budget committee voted to accept $2.56 billion in federal funds in order to bring more low-income Ohio residents into the Medicaid program. This move to expand Medicaid comes after Ohio's General Assembly failed to approve the expansion. Ohio Republican Governor John Kasich fought the right wing of his own party on the issue, and the General Assembly stripped out the Medicaid expansion from his budget proposal. Some Ohio politicians question whether this move is constitutional, so there could be a legal challenge. A third poll is showing U.S. House Republican incumbents are in trouble over the federal government shutdown. The most recent public policy polling survey of 25 GOP-held districts shows the Republican incumbents trailing generic Democrat opponents in 15 of them. Combining the results of all three recent polls, Republican incumbents in 37 GOP-held districts trail Democrats in the polls. Democrats need a net gain of 17 seats to win control of the U.S. House in 2014. Recent Pew Research and NBC Wall Street Journal polls also show Republicans have been badly damaged by the government shutdown. American taxpayers are spending $7 billion a year paying to supplement the low wages of fast food workers. That's according to reports by Berkeley researchers in the National Law Employment Project. U.S. Senator Tom Harkin says the multi-billion dollar fast food companies are paying poverty wages and forcing taxpayers to pick up the slack when workers turn to public assistance. Jersey City's mayor this week signed a city ordinance guaranteeing workers the right to earn paid sick days. More than 30,000 workers will no longer be without paid sick days thanks to the new city ordinance. The law takes effect next year for Jersey City workers at businesses that employ more than 10 people. San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Seattle, Portland, Oregon, New York City, and the state of Connecticut also have guaranteed paid sick day laws. Paid sick leave opponents are using the power of state legislatures to block municipal independence on the issue. Jesse Russell reports. With paid sick leave laws gaining momentum around the country, opponents are seeking to use state legislatures to restrict municipal rights. While state States like Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Vermont move forward on progressive legislation that will provide workers with a minimum number of sick days per year. States like North Carolina and Pennsylvania are going in the opposite direction. Think Progress reports that Pennsylvania has introduced a bill in the House that would prevent municipalities from requiring employers to give workers vacation time or other forms of leave from employment, paid or unpaid, that is not required by federal or state law. In 2011, Wisconsin's Republican Governor Scott Walker passed legislation in his state that nullified Milwaukee's paid sick leave law. The state enacted a similar measure in 2005 under Democratic Governor Jim Doyle that restricted municipalities in Wisconsin from having a minimum wage higher than the state minimum. So far, eight states have passed anti-paid sick leave legislation, and all eight used bills modeled by the American Legislative Exchange Council. You've been listening to WIN, Workers Independent News. For more information, visit laborradio.org. Over 13 million people are affected by famine, war, and drought in the Horn of Africa. Unfortunately, just listening to this commercial won't help them. Just listening won't give them their next meal or shelter or hope. You can help by texting GIVE to 777-444 to donate $10 and by going to usaid.gov FWD to forward the facts. Brought to you by the Ad Council and USAID. Text donations go directly to Consortium of Humanitarian Relief Organizations. Standard text and data rate supply. A problem with trophies is that they tend to tarnish over time. But one that Monsanto recently received came already tarnished by Monsanto itself. This was the World Food Prize, intended to promote sustainable practices that help alleviate hunger in impoverished lands. 
But Monsanto is a predatory, profiteering, proliferator of expensive, genetically altered seeds designed for crops that require large amounts of pesticides and water. The exact opposite of sustainability. Why in the world would it get such a prize? Because Monsanto is a major funder of the foundation that awards this trophy. It even contributed $5 million to restore the foundation's august headquarters in Iowa. So, having given, Monsanto got. The biotech seed manipulator had hoped the prize would help transform its corporate image from an abusive peddler of frankenseeds to an altruistic crusader against global hunger. In particular, it wants the Catholic Church to bless its effort to hook the poor, third-world farmers on its pricey, pesticide-dependent seeds. Monsanto hopes that a World Food Prize will buff its image and impress the Vatican. But that might be a harder sell than the giant first imagined, for, hello, there's a new guy in Rome, and he seems a bit wary of the worldly intentions of the big, rich, and powerful. In fact, Pope Francis could have had Monsanto in mind earlier this year when he declared, the worship of the golden calf of old has found a new and heartless image in the cult of money and the dictatorship of an economy which is faceless and lacking any truly humane goal. This is Jim Hightower saying, ironically, the only one getting an image makeover was the foundation, which has rather grandly tried to label its award the Nobel Prize for Agriculture. By selling it to the profiteer, however, they turned the trophy into the ignoble prize. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy to swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. Welcome back. This is Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch. All weekend, uh, more about the show at TakeActionNews.com. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Find the links at CarlFrisch.com. Joining us now, as he does every week, is our very own Dr. Digipol, Alan Rosenblatt. Alan, thanks for joining us. Good to be here, Carl. All right. So it has been a crazy week in the world of social media, especially as it relates to uh, national security issues. We just finished a segment at the end of the last hour uh, with Tom Matzi, who... Uh, happened to be sitting right there on an Acela train as Michael Hayden, the former head of the NSA, decided that he was going to take the opportunity to call various reporters off the record and badmouth the administration. Um, but he's not the only one uh, that has been caught in kind of a Twitter-fueled controversy this week. Well, we've got the story of National Security Council official uh, Jofi Joseph, uh, who was fired this week for maintaining the anonymous Twitter account NatSec Wonk, National Security Wonk, which included criticisms of the sensitive information and uh, you know attacks against the Obama administration and se former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Uh, he lost his job. He's obviously not the old oldest one. Take us into that story and tell us about it. So uh, I, I really like uh, uh, Colin, Delaney, uh, Colin Delaney's take on this in ePolitics.com, where he says, rule number one when it comes to social media don't be an idiot. <laughs> and and in, indeed, that's what's going on here. Uh, Josie Joseph, who was director of nonproliferation policy uh, for the National Security Council, has apparently been maintaining a uh, an, an anonymous uh, Twitter account called Natsec Wonk, where he, uh, for uh, maybe for a couple of years, has been uh, snarkily tweeting about uh, uh, national security policy, uh, bad mouthing. Press in the in in the field, bad mouthing his colleagues on the National Security Council, uh, and uh, he was uh, recently discovered that it was him doing that, and he lost his job. Well, and Alan, they had to do some investigating to find out who it was. He was actually he didn't have many followers before the scandal broke, but the people that were following him were very influential, uh, which led the government to start investigating to find out who it was. And it just got, which goes to show you that uh, it's not who, how many people follow you, right. who follows you that really matters. 
Well, he was sharing information that was obviously of interest to anybody following the issues um, that they might not have been able to get anywhere else. And it was apparent to anybody reading, especially reporters, that this guy was an insider. Yeah, and even though apparently he didn't reveal any state secrets, uh, he certainly crossed the line of propriety. Uh, you know, the bottom line is, uh, was I think my response to Collins tweet was, you don't poop where you eat. Right. And, uh, and that's really what was going on here is that he was just taking liberties uh, with his employer. You know, it's one thing to set up a snark account to talk about, even anonymously to talk about issues, uh, uh, that affect um, issues that you care about um, and to be snarky about it. Uh, there's certainly a whole proliferation of, uh, of elevator accounts, you know, uh, Pentagon elevator, cap elevator, a bunch of different, which are essentially the elevator over, overhearing conversations at various different organizations, offices, and reporting anonymously on what they heard in the elevator conversations. Uh, but... You know, when you start to insult your employer and to bring a, um, potential embarrassment to your employer, I mean, it's a no-brainer to think that that's going to lose you your job. Well, and he did put out an apology. He released a public statement apologizing for, for what he had done, um, which is not something you get very often in Washington. Um, but, you know, there's reason to believe that he might have been behind another anonymous account that uh, had a bit of a lascivious nature to it as well. Yeah, well, you know, the, the bottom line is it's not that you shouldn't do these anonymous ac uh, accounts because they are entertaining and they have value. They can provide you with the opportunity to do good in a situation where an anonymity really helps. Uh, but you just have to use some common sense. Here. Right. <laughs> really, I mean, the bottom line. Now, the flip side, you know, you may not be on Twitter, as Michael Hayden learned, and you can, um, you know, spend your time talking rather inappropriately and without concern or awareness of the fact that people are listening. And what the Tom Matthews story tells you is that, uh, by and large, there was a, a real, uh, there's a real opportunity for people to overhear things and tweet stuff out that you don't necessarily want them to, uh, to, to share publicly. And, and you just have to be aware in the social media age, not only what you put out, but what people hear that they may put out. Uh, and a tribute to you. Well, and one of the things that caught my eye was this Mashable piece, 10 people who lost their jobs over social media mistakes. Um, you know, one person comes to mind, a certain Colos Danger, um, but there's others as well, right? Yeah, yeah. My favorite story has always been uh, the, uh, the, the staffer from New Media Strategies, which is a, an Arlington, Virginia uh, social media strategy firm. Uh, the company was uh, representing Chrysler, uh, he, uh, this guy had access and was tweeting on behalf of Chrysler. He had it installed on his Twitter phone app. He was in Detroit for a meeting trying to get to it and was stuck in traffic and had the uh, misfortune of tweeting uh, that, I don't know why they call this the Motor City. These people can't effing drive. Unfortunately, he tweeted it over the Chrysler Twitter account. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and while he deleted it right away, it was out there long enough that not only did he lose his job, but New Media Strategies lost the Chrysler account, and they were literally within a day or two of signing a deal with Volkswagen, and Volkswagen decided not to go with them at the last minute. And my understanding is that they ended up losing close to half, uh, basically laying off half of their staff at New Media Strategies because they basically gutted their income. Yeah, absolutely remarkable. I mean, and, and in this day and age, if you tweet something... Even if you delete it, it's still out there for good. Yeah, that's true. So there's, there's sort of best practices that I recommend for people. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, your desktop, if you're using TweetDeck, TweetDeck or HootSuite, I always recommend that even if you have it set up to tweet multiple accounts, including your client accounts, to always set up your personal account as the default so that if you absentmindedly tweet something without bothering to check which account it's going out over, it goes over your personal account not over your client's account. Right. Um, some people go so far with phone applications that um, they have one app that they use for their personal account, and they use a completely separate phone app for their client account. And that way, there's, you know, they always know which one they're logging into. And so the, the, the idea is just basically to minimize the risk of tweeting over the wrong account. 
Well, and the last thing any, anybody wants to do is lose their job over it. What else should they do? Uh, what else they should do is, of course, you really want to make sure that you read your tweets before you hit send. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> you, even on your own account, you really want to make sure you don't tweet things that you don't want people to know. I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, when it comes to privacy concerns on, uh, on social media, the biggest problem with privacy invasions on social media is people tweet things that they should never tweet. They tweet personal privacy, private issues. Well, and if and, folks uh, follow those, those simple rules for themselves, they'll be far less likely to make these mistakes. Dr. Digipol, Alan Rosenblatt, once again, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Carl. All righty, this is Take Action News. When we come back... We're going to talk about the co-author of a great new ebook that you must buy, The Benghazi Hoax. Stick around. Our children are exposed to violence every day in their neighborhoods, in their schools, even in their own homes. Exposure to violence can have a devastating and lifelong impact. Through community action and leadership at the national level, we're identifying the children who need our help. I'm Attorney General Eric Holder, and I'm asking those of you who have a role in a child's life to take action. Through your attention and early intervention, we can help children in need to heal, to thrive. Together, we can change their lives and their futures. Join the Justice Department in defending childhood. 100% success rate in modifying consultation no, 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 no. at 10%. Does this sound familiar? If you're in need of assistance with your mortgage, be careful where you turn for help. Loan modification scammers will offer deals too good to be true. Learn the signs so your life won't be turned upside down. Know it, avoid it, report it. For more information or to report a scam, call 1-888-995-HOPE or visit hud.gov slash prevent loan scams. As a National Guard or Reserve member, you served your country. Now let VA serve you. I wouldn't be here today as a successful woman without the help that I received. VA honors your service by providing a wide range of veterans benefits. From home loans to job training, VA benefits can help with some of life's toughest challenges. What's important about VA benefits is they don't, don't just touch you as an individual. They can touch your parents, maybe your grandparents, your child. Go to benefits.va.gov slash guard reserve to learn more, including how to apply online using e-benefits. I just finished a master's degree recently, and now I'm working on another degree as well. So the military made that all possible. My veterans benefits made that all possible. No matter what the time is, apply for your benefits. You earn them. VA is ready to help you. Achieve your next mission. Learn about and apply for your VA benefits today. Friends, David Schuster here, and all of us at WEAC Radio are so proud of our neighbors here in Southeast D.C., especially one of our partners, The Ark. The Ark is at 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast. It's the home to some of Washington's best, including the Washington Ballet, the Levine School of Music, Boys and Girls Club, and the Children's Health Project all provide a number of programs and services within the very same facility. The Ark is also home to the Ark Theater, the only theater east of the river, which hosts a variety of dance, music, and theatrical shows each year. Almost everything you could want is at the Ark, so stop by and see them. The Ark, 1901 Mississippi Avenue in Southeast. For more information, visit the Ark's website, www.thearkdc.org. Or call 202-889-5901. The Ark, part of Southeast D.C. We Act Radio is a very proud partner of the Start at Westminster, a harm reduction, prevention, and awareness initiative sponsored by the Westminster Presbyterian Church right here in D.C. Start stands for Syringe Treatment Advocacy Resources Training. These are the core elements of the harm reduction philosophy at Start. The goal of this program is to reduce transmissions of HIV, hepatitis, and other blood-borne infectious diseases by empowering those at risk of infection with the tools, resources, and referrals they need to take charge of their health. Over the past year, the Start at Westminster tested over 1,600 people, and they're averaging about 150 tests each month. And of course, with the proper funding, that number could go even higher. For more information on this terrific program, go to www.startatwestminster.org or 
visit the Westminster Presbyterian Church, 400 I Street Southwest, right here in Washington, D.C. Take Action News. If you've been following politics at all over the last uh, just over a year, one thing is the constant refrain from the right. Um, and if you wanted to know how ingrained in the right it is, all you had to do was look at the issues surrounding the shutdown of the government and the near default on the debt ceiling. The second we came out of those two things and compromise was reached, and when I say compromise, Republicans got nothing. Um, uh, the second those were reached, Fox News returned to Benghazi. Um, and in a great new ebook that you have to purchase, uh, David Brock and Ari Rabenhoft, uh, along with the researchers of Media Matters for America, delve into the Benghazi hoax uh, to find the truth behind the right wing lies. Uh, joining us now to talk about this great new ebook that you can pick up uh, on Amazon.com and other places is Ari Rabenhoft. Ari, thanks for joining us. Hey, Carl. Thanks for having me. And uh, absolutely. On, uh, on taking over Take Action News. I appreciate it, Ari. Um, and I know that uh, you've been hosting on Sirius XM uh, the agenda for quite some time now. And you get those phone calls from the truckers, just like every other progressive radio host out there, uh, that no matter what you say, the response is Benghazi. It's like Pavlov's dog at this point. I mean, uh, yeah, I would say actually the truckers, the truckers tend to know the truth about Benghazi because they, <laughs> they've been listening to Sirius XM Progress for long enough that they do. It's the, <laughs> it's the random right wing caller surfing the channels who hears the word Benghazi thinks uh, thinks it's going to be about how Barack Obama is, is should be impeached. And when they don't hear that, freak out and start calling, screaming Benghazi repeatedly over and over and over again. But uh, before we continue, where can folks buy the book just so they can go there right now and start downloading it? Right now, Amazon.com, a Benghazi hoax. It should be up on the other ones uh, soon. It just I, I don't quite understand the digital book stuff, but the other places take time. All right. So what's the response? been? I, I saw one story from The New York Times about Fox News not having any comments. Surprise, surprise. Um, what's the reception been like for the book thus far? Look, we've we're, we're we've been in the top 20 nonfiction books on Amazon overall uh, on for Kindle uh, since we launched it. Uh, we've been the number one bestseller in a number of categories. It's always nice to look on Amazon and see that number one bestseller tag next to a right. book. Um, you know, we've been in, in the top 200 books overall, fiction or nonfiction, on the site. So it's it's selling pretty well because I think progressives are tired of being on the defense here. And what I've been telling people is that they should use this book as kind of like their, uh, you know, primary research material on how to talk about Benghazi when their right wing relatives come to them over the holidays and say Benghazi, 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 pass the stuffing. Yeah, really, because the story doesn't change. So Thanksgiving's coming up. You're going to be around the table, and let's. I don't have a crazy conservative uncle, but <laughs> I have a crazy a conservative family. <laughs> so, so your family, Carl, they're going to say, "Would you like some cranberry sauce and helping a Benghazi?" Right. And, and they're going to say, "You know what goes great with turkey Benghazi?" What's the and, biggest myth about the the Benghazi um, issue that folks should I, know I the answer say, to? I don't know biggest, but most disgusting is the general idea that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama left our boys and our men to die in Benghazi. It's something you hear over and over and over again, and it's just not true. And there are a number of different elements to that myth. First of all, the idea that a stand-down order was given. Well, we can contradict that with an easy piece of evidence, and you'll find that evidence in footnote 177 of the Benghazi hoax, because there are like 200 footnotes, and at 99 cents, that means you're paying half a penny a footnote, which <laughs> I, I, you can't really get that deal anywhere. And these are not right-wing footnotes, by the way. When you actually look up the stories, they they bolster and back up the claims made in the yes, book. They're, they're either primary sources or, like when we link to Media Matters, we link to Media Matters only because there's video that we're specifically pointing to, not because we're citing ourselves. Right. Um, we're citing essentially 90% as primary sources or primary sources of information from a, or sources of information from a non-biased party. So if you look at the stand down order, you'll notice the Republican chairman of the House committees that were investigating Benghazi, including Daryl Issa, released a statement saying there was no stand down order. So I, I can't contradict it better myself. Um, 
They say there was no stand down order. There was no there was no stand down order. The idea that that there was some ability to rescue these guys that wasn't carried out is false. We go through all the reasons why we look at, you know, there was a C-130 here. There was a SEAL team here. There was, we go through all of that. We go through, but essentially what the book is, it's a story. It's a book of, it's a story about how the right wing converted tragedy into scandal. And that's, well, that's what this book's about. Well, and you know, the one thing that I get whenever I tweet uh, or comment about Benghazi is, Oh, you're making four people died. There's no hoax. Four people died. And my response simply is read the book because what you'll find out is that, yes, four people died. And those four people are being used as political punching bags to make right wing political points. Right. And that's the point. The, the, the Benghazi hoax isn't that four people died. That's a tragedy. Right. That's that's incredibly sad. And like, you know, I have friends uh, in D.C., very close friends who were friends with Chris Stevens. Right, who who personally were impacted by his death. That's not a hoax. The hoax is taking his death and converting it into political scandal. Absolutely. Um, and so it's an ebook, which means that folks can download it and read it on yep. any player. Um, you know, this is like the the next step. I mean, all my books are going to be on on uh, a Kindle at some point. Um, but what I like about it is that it's it's ascertainable like i can i can finish the thing in a in a in a you know it's, a, it's a sitting one, and... it's, it's 100 pages and the chapters are short so let's say you like to read your books in in a, in a place where you don't want to be for a long time with short chapters it fits that well and and the good thing about that is that it's not so dense that you'll get lost in the explanation um and no, it's, it's i know story. from experience with my conservative about friends and family, that you have to keep it really simple if they're going to, to take it. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's a story. It's a story about how to perpetuate a hoax on the American people. And we're very clear about who did this. We, we put them, the first page you get when you open up the ebook in the file is a, is a list of the hoaxers. So the we Benghazi just, hoaxers. Right it's, like, it's like being an Obama truther. So who are the, who are the biggest hoaxers? Well, I mean, first off, you, you know, you give the grand prize to Daryl Issa, right? Right. Um, then you go to, like, the origin, the, the, let's call him the OG of the Benghazi scandal, uh, Mitt Romney, who, <laughs> who really began, the, the, who really started it, uh, uh, the hoax, during his campaign by issuing a widely condemned press release. So you have, you have, you have Mitt Romney. And that mess um, of a then, press conference. Right. And then you have your, you know, your Fox News guys. You have Sean Hannity, of course, uh, Eric Bowling, the, the hosts of Fox and Friends. They're all in. Then you have some like Republican attorneys who always pop up every time there's a Democratic scandal. Uh, specifically, Victoria Tenzing would be uh, would be would be the one I would cite. Now, I saw David Brock, your co-author in this on MSNBC last weekend, and he identified her as a major Benghazi hoaxer. Yes. Um, and look, she was the whistleblower attorney, and she's gone on TV repeatedly and just told flat out lies about Benghazi over and over and over again. And frankly, it, it should be people who are known as liars should at some point give up the right to go on TV and lie. But haven't we learned? I mean, I was talking about this earlier in the show with Ben, uh, uh, ben Armbruster from Think Progress, their national security editor there that for some reason the media, this so-called liberal media, um, has no problem inviting the exact same cast of right-wing characters on to talk about national security that were wrong about the war in Afghanistan and wrong about the war in Iraq. People well, like Bill Crystal and others. goes back to, to the Clinton scandal days where mm -hmm. she was identified as a widespread liar. Um, and, and yet they're always invited back. I mean, you wouldn't allow somebody this wrong so many times. If a plumber came to your house and broke your toilet when they were trying to fix it and broke your sink when they were trying to fix it, you would not call them about your garbage disposal. Well, you're not Fox News. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, and my understanding is that you all have an ad that you're trying to air on Fox News as well. Well, I think I think we tried, and I think I think Fox has decided that, that they don't like money. Um, <laughs> uh, because we sent them a check, and they decided they decided not to accept our check. Um, look, we shouldn't be surprised in that, Carl, if you'll recall, once David and I paid $86,000 oh, 
at a charity auction to try to have lunch with Rupert Murdoch, and I can now put at the top of my resume, Rupert Murdoch paid $86,000 not to have lunch with him. <laughs> well, uh, the great thing is that you don't have to spend $86,000 to buy your copy of the Benghazi hoax. It's 99, 99 cents. 99 cents on on Amazon so that you can have the facts to fight your right-wing family members at Thanksgiving and the holidays this year. Uh, Ari Rabenhoff, co-author of the Benghazi hoax, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Carl. All righty. And you can get your copy or watch the ad that Fox News doesn't want you to see at the ben- at BenghaziHoax.com. Uh, pick up your copy. This is Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch, and we'll be back after this. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC 1480 AM. Now get out there and do something. If you're planning to replace your Social Security card simply because you don't have it, you may not need to replace it at all. What's most important is that you remember your Social Security number. Remember during school how you memorized information and answers for tests? In the same way, you should memorize your social security number. Knowing your number is important, but having the card may not be. If you really do need to get a replacement card to show to an employer, it's easy to apply for a new one. Find out how at www.socialsecurity.gov slash ssnumber. Say you want to go to college. Yay! A Big Ten college. But you don't want to feel like part of the, well, you know. Is there an answer for you? Of course. Indiana University East. Go Red Indiana University East. You'll get the quality of a Big Ten education in a small college setting. IU East offers more than 50 fields of study, from accounting to political science, taught by internationally recognized faculty with an average of 18 students per class. So it's not... Student number 95A-6273, please report to... It's more like... Hey, John, welcome to class. Best of all, you'll graduate with one of the most respected degrees anywhere, a degree from IU. Don't wait. Go to iue.edu... Or call 800-959-EAST to arrange a visit to Indiana University East. IU. Focused on you. Hey, Gatcha News is proud to be sponsored by Healthcare for America Now. HCAN is a national coalition of more than 1,000 groups in 50 states representing 30 million people. HCAN works to promote, defend, implement, and improve the Affordable Care Act at both the state and federal levels. They also try to protect Medicare and Medicaid, increase corporate accountability, and confront forces that seek to take away critical services. HCAN believes in creating jobs, not cutting programs people depend on. HCAN runs comprehensive issue campaigns that mobilize people at the grassroots and define the public debate. HCAN is fighting to protect, implement, and improve the new health care law through national and state-based legislative and regulatory campaigns built on grassroots action, public education, communications, policy analysis, and groundbreaking research. HCAN has become a respected voice and national leader on health care while continuing to focus on aggressive field activity. Support HCAN, Healthcare for America Now. Hello, my name is Jim Gray, and I am a judge of the Superior Court in California and a former federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. I would like to talk to you for a moment about marijuana. Did you know that since the federal government first banned marijuana in 1937, usage in this country has actually gone up by about 4,000%? Or did you know that in the Netherlands, where adults are allowed to possess small amounts of marijuana and buy it from government-regulated businesses, fewer adults and fewer teenagers smoke marijuana than here in our country? Or that an American is arrested on marijuana charges every 38 seconds? If you are wondering if any of this makes sense, you are not alone. 
To find out more, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thank you and good luck to us all. News. I'm Carl Frisch all weekend. Um, to say that Fox News gets it wrong would be an understatement. And we just finished talking to Ari Rabenhoff, the author of the new book, The Benghazi Hoax. And, you know, there's no network that's a bigger uh, racket of hoaxers than Fox News, uh, which is why this piece in Salon.com caught my attention uh, under the headline Inside the Fox News Lime Machine, I fact checked Sean Hannity on Obamacare. I feel like the end of that title should be so that you don't have to friggin' watch. Uh, as an alumni myself of Media Matters for America, I can tell you how much better it is to have people watching for you. Um, and joining us to chat about this piece of work is Eric Stern, a contributor at Salon.com. Eric, thanks for joining us. Uh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Uh, absolutely. So uh, I, I read your piece uh, with a bit of glee and a smile despite the subject matter. Um, and how enraging it can be to know that Hannity, Sean Hannity, uh, the primetime host at Fox News, had a panel discussion with six people impacted horribly by Obamacare. And you decided, well, let's check and see what their stories were and if they actually panned out. What did you find? Um, I found that they didn't pan out. And what <laughs> Hannity was surprise. claiming was... was was six nightmares, six Obamacare nightmares was actually not six Obamacare nightmares. In fact, these folks did have problems with their insurance. They were problems in the current system, uh, not not problems with the future system. They had nothing to do with Obamacare. Well, let's take them one by one uh, and and walk through because you know what's interesting about it is a lot of the way that these people told their stories on Fox illustrates the broader narratives that we see time and time again on Fox and in conservative media circles. Uh, that are used to attack uh, the health care law. Um, so let's take the first person that you spoke to uh, when you decided to go in and chat with the folks that were in the segment on Hannity's program, Paul Cox of Leicester, Leicester, I'm, I'm never going to get it right, from North Carolina. <laughs> um, you, you chatted with him. What was his story and what did you find out? Well, he told Hannity that he was having a, uh, that he was basically having to reduce his workforce because of Obamacare. Well, and as as you and I know, uh, Obamacare really only impacts employers with fifty or more employees, so he must be a pretty big businessman. Which is what I assumed, and then when I talked to him, it turned out that he had only four employees for his small masonry and construction business. And so I asked him, well, why? Why then are you taking measures uh, uh, preemptively against to do do as you say to Obamacare? Um, and he sort of told me that he would call me back, <laughs> and then that was the last I heard from him. Did you try him back after after that? Uh, no, because he <laughs> basically gave me the answer that I needed. I mean, I asked right. him I said, he, before he hung up. Me, he said, "Well, he said, well, I don't have to do it, but I I've chosen to do it." I said, "I said, okay, well." Only back and we'll talk about it some more, and he never did. So that right, was, uh, talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I was kind of. I, I guess I wasn't that surprised. But there are a lot of people that that watch Fox or listen to conservative uh, radio that believe that uh, companies are being forced to uh, take health care away from their workers. Um, right. Well, they believe and everything, and they believe everything else that Fox says, and and. I don't know that there is any solution to that problem that you just cited. That people, that, 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 that millions of people are generally misinformed on a regular basis by Fox, and not just by Fox, but by certain kinds of conservative talk radio. Um, and I don't, I don't really think I that I think that's a problem that might be here to stay, and we just have to. Deal well, with the, it. I think the misinformation problem is here to stay, um, but I think the solution to that specific problem around the health care law is actually just the health care law sticking around for some time. Uh, eventually, it's going to start being picked up by people that are against Obamacare. They're going to start signing up for coverage, and they're going to be shocked the first time they go to the website and find out that there's not a government plan at all. They're all private companies. That's correct. They, most people, most people appear, it appears that most people will, will and, and again, the, the interesting thing to note about, about these six guests is that they were all, Buying uh, private, buying health insurance privately. They didn't work for large employers. 
Right. They all essentially had their own sort of small businesses and uh, with, with none or, or a few employees. And um, and so they're in that, you know, that section of America that basically has to go out and pay retail for health insurance. And that's the that's the environment I'm in. Um, and right. and I've been there before. I've been there before myself. And and I know that um, uh, generally speaking, almost all those people and certainly the people that I spoke to, certainly some of the folks that were on the, the ones that the ones that on Hannity that were citing their their costs their premium cost or premium hikes as evidence of an Obamacare failure, they they will do better on the exchange. Well, and yeah, let's look at let's look at this next woman that you spoke to, uh, Allison DeGenis. Um, DeNice. Allison DeNice. DeNice. Yeah. Um, I'll get one of the last names uh, correct at some point in this. So her husband worked. At, so she, her husband worked at a large company. He left to start his own business, and then the two of them now spend thirteen grand to insure themselves and one daughter. The other daughter. Is uninsured because she has a pre-existing condition, and if they wanted to insure her, it would cost them almost nineteen grand. This is what they told Hannity, and she confirmed it to me on the phone. And so when I shopped for a plan in her zip code, um, you know, looking up the exchange prices, it looked like she could get a plan for as low as seventy-six hundred. And what was her so response that's, that's to that? Saving. That's a, that's almost you know it's twelve thousand dollars of savings. Right, and it covers the un- uncovered child. And to be fair, she did say, you know, she said, yeah, I'll probably go look at the exchange. You know, and she didn't sound too happy about the fact that she was going to have to do it. But, you know, she at least, you know, you and I know that that's not a surprise. And that obviously if somebody can, can save $12,000, they're at least going to go take a look at the prices, right? Well, and, you know, to me, obviously they're willing to spend a lot of money on their health care. They are currently. Um, and, you know, the fact that they are spending money all the while not being able to cover everybody in their family should make anybody concerned. Um, and the notion that they would be against something, but, you know, contempt prior to investigation when they can not only save money, but also cover everybody in their family is just shocking um, and, and emblematic of the problem that we have here. A lot of people trusting what they've heard. I mean, the exact same thing with uh, Robbie and Tina Robinson uh, from Franklin, Tennessee, which is just outside of Nashville. You talk to them. Robbie is self-employed and he's a Christian youth motivational speaker. What did they have to say? Well, they told Hannity that, that they that they are you know they don't like the fact that they are being told that their current plan will have to will have to change and become ACA compliant uh, because it turns out that that new plan will have all sorts of benefits that they don't need. Um, will it will it cover the sniffles? Yeah, that struck me as a little odd because all insurance policies right have benefits that that have some benefits that the person but Eric the enlistee uh, I, I didn't realize that. Obamacare covered things that uh, I don't necessarily have a use for. I guess I'll stop signing. I don't get the sniffles. Does it cover the sniffles? Right, right. Well, they were they were citing they don't have kids, for example, and they, they were citing the fact that. By the way, they claimed that they claimed that they were advised by an insurance broker that 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 an ACA compliant policy would, by definition, cover things like prenatal care. Now they don't. Their kids are all grown and out of the house. So, but but that wasn't the, the interesting part. What was interesting was when I called Robbie. He said he and Tina said that. They now pay um, around ten grand a year uh, to buy a policy out of pocket, and I and there was one as low as thirty-seven. I think it was like thirty-seven hundred bucks or thirty-seven hundred and sixty dollars on the on the exchange. Now, in fairness, that, that's just not to say that that's the policy that will work for them. But if they're pay, staying, if they're now paying ten grand. Whatever policy they get on the exchange, it will likely it will likely save them money. And what was their response to that? Again, being shown that there was. Perhaps great well, savings you know, they, to be had. They they told me they weren't going to go on the exchange because they didn't like Obamacare and they were sort of they they don't they don't like the whole business. So they just were sort of being stubborn about it. Well, you know they they're entitled to do that, but they're going to have to keep paying you know higher rates, I suppose. And and what about the other folks that you talked to? I mean, the same problems persisting. Say that again. The, the same issues that you keep on running into over and over again. Um, are these these basic facts when it comes to. Uh, Obamacare. Um, uh, did you you spoke with others that were on the panel too? Um, and well, well, no, that was that was the, those, yeah, those were the six. It was it was it was the Denices, the Coxes, and the right. and the Robesons. And I spoke to all you know, I spoke to all of them, or or, or uh, you know, and and or I didn't speak to Paul's. Uh, I spoke to Paul. I spoke to Paul, and I spoke to Allison, and then I spoke to Robbie and Tina together. And what and was they were all? What's dead. the response been since since your work was published? Uh, it got a tremendous response. It has 
flown around the internet um, and the blogosphere, and it has been sort of cited by the New York Times, the L.A. Times, the Chicago Tribune, and the Washington Post um, as evidence of sort of the you know how how the right how the right wing has been misinforming people. Have you heard from right wingers? You know, I got some twi- some tweets from right wingers, and you know how it is they're 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 unhappy with the fact that I what I wrote what I wrote, but they uh, there wasn't uh, again even those you know somewhat malicious uh, tweets at me didn't weren't really based on facts. Uh, it just occurs to me, you know, um, the best anecdote or uh, antidote rather uh, to the problems that we're seeing here is going to be people hearing from their friends that they got health care for a fraction of what they were paying before or having a relative uh, that is able to get coverage when they've not had coverage for years because of a pre-existing condition. Um, that's what will break through the lies that they've been told. And what's fascinating, and, and perhaps uh, if you can stick around after the break, we can talk a little bit about the problems politically that a movement runs into when an issue that they've been pushing for this long uh, turns out to have been a ruse. It reminds me a great deal of the public polling denialism uh, in the 2012 election and how shocked people were when Mitt Romney didn't win. Uh, Eric, would you mind sticking around? Sure, sure. All right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about uh, the reaction that people are having to health care reform now that it's open for enrollment uh, with Eric Stern, a contributor at Salon.com. Stick around. Education beyond high school, a path to opportunity and success for our young people, the key to building a better life for themselves and ultimately their own children. But for many, all this is only a dream, because the challenge of paying for education beyond high school seems to put this opportunity out of reach. But there is an organization that can help. Each year we award $80 billion in grants, low-interest loans, and work study to students in colleges, trade schools, and professional schools. We are federal student aid, part of the U.S. Department of Education. You can learn more by logging on to federalstudentaid.ed.gov. We may be able to help you realize your dreams, so don't get left behind. After all, the most costly education is the one not begun. Federal Student Aid. Start here. Go further. I'm home. Hey, Mom. So, what did you do today? I noticed the dishes are still in the sink. I've been busy. Getting your taxes done like we talked about? Oh, I got my friend Dave on that. Hey, he's only charging 20 bucks. Not Dave from your high school class who graduated three years late. Yeah, he's good with numbers. Won our fantasy football league last year. Jeff, I can't believe you would actually take your... Kidding, Mom. I took all my paperwork over to that preparer just like you recommended. Using a paid tax preparer this year? Visit irs.gov for some do's and don'ts. Like look for a preparer who has a preparer tax ID number and signs your return. Check out their qualifications and review your tax return before you sign it. Oh, Jeff, why do you do this to me? Mom, you're just so easy. (laughs) irs.gov. It's the best tax tip of all. Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Marins, and I'm here to talk to you about Take Action News with David Schuster. Every week we talk politics, government, and what you can do to take action. David Schuster talks with today's leading political minds. Uh, Valerie, so many people will know your name, know your story out because of those dastardly actions by the Bush administration to try to discredit your husband who called them out for their lies that led up to the Iraq war. And, and in so going after him, they leaked your name 10 years since the start of the Iraq war. Has your perspective on, on any of this changed? Do you still carry around uh, uh, any sort of anger or frustration to the Bush administration? How have you been dealing with it all these years? Until the right is able to come to terms with the reality that we were lied into this war and it was not a good idea and it wasn't to liberate the Iraqi people. They will just continue to live in, uh, you know, la-la land and perpetuate the lies that got us into the war in the first place. Tune in from noon to 3 p.m. every Saturday right here on We Act Radio. 
When our daughter Ava was four, we noticed she didn't talk much. A genetic test revealed that she had hearing loss caused by two mutated genes, one she inherited from myself, the other from her dad. If it weren't for the amazing people at U of M, we might have never known the true cause of Ava's hearing loss or how to properly treat it. The University of Michigan C.S. Mott Children's Hospital is one of only a handful of hospitals in the world researching genetic hearing loss in addition to treating it. Our breakthrough research and advanced treatments combined with outstanding care help us change children's lives in extraordinary ways. For the leaders and best in pediatric care, call a Mott patient advisor at 877-475-MOTT or visit MottChildren.org. She is more talkative now and more social. She loves music now. She's humming to the music and it's sweet to actually hear her humming. To learn more, call 877-475-MOTT. They not only helped us find answers, they helped Ava find her voice. That's the Michigan difference. Welcome back. This is Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch all weekend. So we're chatting with Eric Stern. He's a contributor at Salon.com. Eric, thanks for sticking around. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, at the end of the 2012 elections, uh, as things were coming to a close, there was this phenomenon on the right called unskewing the polls, because don't you know that numbers like the media and science and letters and shapes and colors and our pets uh, all have a liberal bias? Um, so they had to unskew the polls to show that Mitt Romney was actually going to beat the Kenyan in the White House. Um, and you all just didn't know what you were talking about. And Republicans were going to win 65 seats in the Senate and yada, 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 cut to election night. And they're shocked when Obama mops the floor with Mitt Romney. So much so that many people began doubting uh, the very people that were serving up uh, the healthy diet of misinformation. Fox News, Karl Rove, etc. cetera. Uh, now, I, I can't help but draw the parallel with where we've come since then. Um, so you've had this right wing infrastructure of media, uh, advocacy organizations and politicians telling the base, the Tea Party base, the activists who write their little five dollar checks and everything else to, to keep these gears running, saying we can shut down the government. We can exceed the debt ceiling and we'll get rid of Obamacare by doing these things. And then we'll defund Obamacare and then we'll get rid of Obamacare and we'll do this and we'll do that. And Obamacare will be gone. And then the reality sets in. They can't kill Obamacare. It's here. It's the law of the land, no matter how many times they continue to call it a bill. At what point do you think this reality begins to set in on the right wing base? You know, um, they don't seem to be they don't seem to they don't seem very concerned with reality. <laughs> uh, they don't you know, they keep I mean, it was clear that there was never a winning for example, this latest, you know, chapter, there was never a winning strategy. There was no end game. And yet it didn't appear to phase the sort of the Ted Cruz faction of the Republican Party, that there was no that they were basically getting into a game that they were going to lose. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for it. One of the biggest problems, obviously, is that a lot of these politicians don't really have to answer to the electorate anymore politically. Right. They answer to the primary electorate. Well, to that point, um, you know, I've been saying for a while now that Republicans have begun to squander a very precious commodity that they had to hold on to, um, you know, because of demographic shifts and population growth in certain segments of society that can't stand Republicans. Um, the idea, you know, that they had this institutional advantage by gerrymandering these solid majorities that could have lasted for 20 years. But because they've been so extreme, because of their fear of being primaried, they may have screwed the pooch, so to speak. They may have taken what was going to be a 15 or 20 year majority in the House, despite demographic changes in this country, and made it more like the next two or four years. Maybe they'll be gone in, in 2014 when they could have been here through 2025. That's possibly so. That's possibly so. In other words, they set up a system in which, in which, in which they were able to behave in a certain way, uh, or and in fact even had to behave in a certain way. And the problem with that is that it's it's caused it's caused the greater portion of America and particularly persuadable voters to be really turned off. And I don't think this is going to end well going forward for Republicans. I think that they have sort of you know obviously they've overplayed their hand, um, and the Tea Party just has a real bad smell on it. Well, it's as if the last page of all those autopsies we heard about in January and February and March was just kidding. Because, you know, coming out of the election, Republicans basically had two choices, right? They had hurt now or hurt later. Um, 
i.e. kick the crazies out now and lose about 25% of your party, the really activist crazies, um, and you won't be able to win elections for very, you know, in the near term, but at least independents who have found you objectionable will begin to see that you're serious about changing uh, the way that you're perceived and that you're changing on some solid issues that they find important. You could do that, or you could do nothing right now and hurt as demographics become less and less advantageous to you for the foreseeable future, um, it's, right. which is well, not the optimal right. course of and action. Those, and, he, and neither of those options is very palatable. <laughs> those, neither of them really work. Well, I mean, I honestly think yeah, that there is room for a conservative party in this country. Um, it just needs to be something that is more independent conservative. It needs to be away from the economic extremism and the social, uh, you know, uh, abortion, gay rights extremism um, and the anti-immigrant fervor. I mean, that really only makes up like 15 to 20 percent of this country. Uh, there's plenty of room for for the rest of the Republicans uh, to start winning back independence if they would reject right. those folks. But they've got to hurt now. And that's why they're not doing it, because how many of them would have to lose their primaries in order to make the point? Right. The, the, the big, you know, one of the things I've learned in this business is a really good presidential candidate has a way of riding the boat for a party that's not doing very well. Right. Um, and so we'll see who they put up in 2016. Their problem, but in that regard, is actually is actually quite serious, and that is that normal people <laughs> are sort of shying away from the Republican Party nowadays. They're going to have, in the next five to ten years, a serious candidate recruitment problem. Because what person who is intellectually gifted and maybe successful in the private sector, you know, and is, and is at least somewhat sort of level-headed and reasonable and, 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 and an open-minded person, what such person is going to be running as a Republican nowadays? They have a candidate recruitment uh, problem that is, that is already, they're already experiencing it, but it's going to get worse. Right. I keep on telling my Republican friends, look, you don't have to be pro-gay to win a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of the country, uh, gay people. You have to be pro-LGBT equality so the independent voters don't think you're crazy. Yeah, I mean, you just have to right. And, it's, and, and, and you just have to be you have to be normal. And they're they're, they're not. They, I, don't, I just don't see sort of. You know, and particularly you see it down at the local level, and right. a lot of the a lot of the sort of you know state legislators and state officials. I mean, look at this guy Cuccinelli. I mean, look at some of these guys around the country. They're just like you know they think that extremism is normal. Well, and, and it's and, it's it's the feeder program, right? Since fewer yes, people take part exactly. in primaries, and fewer people take part in local primaries, and fewer people take part in municipal primaries, the whole feeder mechanism is broken for the Republican Party. You know, you're starting out with crazy city council people that lead to crazy state legislators that lead to crazy state officials that lead to lost exactly. governorships and lost Senate seats. Exactly. And they then they end up and you spend you make a career moving through that rank. You, you learn you become accustomed to talking to people in a way that just doesn't work when you actually have to sort of you know run for governor or for president, you know, and, and actually talk to some talk to normal Americans. That's well, and you and I have been in Washington, you know, and talked to Republicans who say, look, I don't really believe this crap. Um, I just have to say it back home. I mean, there are plenty of rational Republicans in Washington and state capitals around the country. They just can't say rational things when they go out for votes. That's correct. They can't say that global warming, they can't say that the Earth's temperature is increasing, which is a scientific fact. And which a lot of them believe, but they, they could never say. say. A lot of them can't even say that the, that the Earth is, is older, is definitively older than 6,000 years. <laughs> right. I mean, you, I'm not uh, And a lot of them can't say that they believe evolution. I, I, mean, I tell you, real, Eric, it's why one of my favorite books is The Republican War on Science. Eric, we're going to have to leave it there. I really appreciate you coming on to talk about these things, no matter how depressing they are. Uh, Eric Stern, contributor with Salon.com. Uh, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. All righty. This is Take Action News here all weekend. I'm Carl Frisch. Don't forget to connect with me on Twitter and Facebook at Carl Frisch. And when we come back in the next hour, we're going to be joined by our good friend Jason Stanford. And we're also going to talk about the politics around drones and whether or not uh, the use of drones in a war setting is a war crime. A uh, special report out from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International towards that end. So stick around, and we'll be back after this. Hey. 
Hey there, Matthew Filipovich here, host of the creatively titled Matthew Filipovich Show, which, by the way, you can hear every single Saturday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. right here on 1480 a.m. We Act Radio. Now, I'm going to be honest with you people. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but... But I like talking to smart people, people who are smarter than me, some of the smartest, funniest, most badass progressives out there. People like Glenn Greenwald, Naomi Klein, Jane Uger of the Young Turks, Jamie Kilstein, Allison Kilkenny, Alan Grayson, Jeremy Scahill, Jim Hightower, and more. That's right, I said more. Don't believe me? Well, tune in to the Matthew Filipovich Show every single Saturday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. for some of the best in liberal talk, news, comedy, and interviews right here on 1480 AM, We Act Radio. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC 1480 AM. Now get out there and do something. Care to hear a mind-blowing fact about your chances of being arrested this year? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. In 2011, the last year for which statistics are available, for every 100 people in America, four, four were arrested in one year. This data was recently reported in the Huffington Post and came from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. More people are arrested on alleged drug offenses than for any other crime. And though blacks and whites use drugs and sell them at about the same rate, blacks are arrested at a rate four times greater than whites. Since 1980, as reported by Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness, the number of people in prison for drug offenses since 1980 has increased by over 1,000 percent. And get this, the majority of people in prison are not locked up for serious offenses, not for crimes of violence, not for selling drugs, not for having a long previous record. Of course, being arrested does not mean you'll end up with a conviction or in prison. But an arrest can cost you housing, credit, a professional license, a visa, and for sure, a job. Arrest is the entry point into the perverted, unjust, racist world of criminal justice. And mass incarceration is the unjust and obvious ultimate result. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. This is the Working Virginia Update. I'm Jesse Russell. The Virginia Education Association has been mobilizing members to help get out the vote. This included a big push on October 19th that included members knocking on doors and making phone calls. VEA President Meg Gruber. Just anything we can do to make sure that the citizens of Virginia realize that there is an important election coming up and encouraging them to get out and vote. The VEA has endorsed Democratic candidate Terry McAuliffe over Republican Ken Cuccinelli, setting McAuliffe's pledge to reverse declines in school funding and a commitment to address issues with testing. And we just want to remind everybody that when it comes to public education, that it's really the governor who has a much bigger influence over that than the president of the United States does. This update made possible by the Office and Professional Employees International Union, ensuring fair treatment, fair wages, and benefits for thousands of working Virginians. Online at opeiu.org. Packers. Vikings. We come from different places. Uptown. Downtown. We come to different conclusions. Half empty. Half full. But when we live united, we make a real difference in the building blocks of life. Children succeed in school. Families gain financial stability. The health of our neighbors improves, and suddenly so do our communities. Real change won't happen without you. Live Live United. United. So give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. Sign up today at liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. You're listening to WIN, Workers Independent News, a production of Diversified Media Enterprises. I'm Doug Cunningham. Ohio is moving to expand Medicaid eligibility under the Affordable Care Act, but a legal challenge is expected. A state bipartisan budget committee voted to accept $2.56 billion in federal funds in order to bring more low-income Ohio residents into the Medicaid program. This move to expand Medicaid comes after Ohio's General Assembly failed to approve the expansion. Ohio Republican Governor John Kasich fought the right wing of his own party on the issue, and the General Assembly stripped out the Medicaid expansion from his budget proposal. Some Ohio politicians question whether this move is constitutional, 
so there could be a legal challenge. A third poll is showing U.S. House Republican incumbents are in trouble over the federal government shutdown. The most recent public policy polling survey of 25 GOP-held districts shows the Republican incumbents trailing generic Democrat opponents in 15 of them. Combining the results of all three recent polls, Republican incumbents in 37 GOP-held districts trailed Democrats in the polls. Democrats need a net gain of 17 seats to win control of the U.S. House in 2014. Recent Pew Research and NBC Wall Street Journal polls also show Republicans have been badly damaged by the government shutdown. American taxpayers are spending $7 billion a year paying to supplement the low wages of fast food workers. That's according to reports by Berkeley researchers in the National Law Employment Project. U.S. Senator Tom Harkin says the multi-billion dollar fast food companies are paying poverty wages and forcing taxpayers to pick up the slack when workers turn to public assistance. Jersey City's mayor this week signed a city ordinance guaranteeing workers the right to earn paid sick days. More than 30,000 workers will no longer be without paid sick days thanks to the new city ordinance. The law takes effect next year for Jersey City workers at businesses that employ more than 10 people. San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Seattle, Portland, Oregon, New York City, and the state of Connecticut also have guaranteed paid sick day laws. Paid sick leave opponents are using the power of state legislatures to block municipal independence on the issue. Jesse Russell reports. With paid sick leave laws gaining momentum around the country, opponents are seeking to use state legislatures to restrict municipal rights. While states like Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Vermont move forward on progressive legislation that will provide workers with a minimum number of sick days per year, states like North Carolina and Pennsylvania are going in the opposite direction. Think Progress reports that Pennsylvania has introduced a bill in the House that would prevent municipalities from requiring employers to give workers vacation time or other forms of leave from employment, paid or unpaid, that is not required by federal or state law. In 2011, Wisconsin's Republican Governor Scott Walker passed legislation in his state that nullified Milwaukee's paid sick leave law. The state enacted a similar measure in 2005 under Democratic Governor Jim Doyle that restricted municipalities in Wisconsin from having a minimum wage higher than the state minimum. So far, eight states have passed anti-paid sick leave legislation, and all eight used bills modeled by the American Legislative Exchange Council. You've been listening to WIN, Workers Independent News. For more information, visit laborradio.org. American citizens everywhere are demanding and supporting speedy and complete action. Broadcasting from the We Act Radio Studios in Washington, D.C., heard live across the nation, this is Take Action News. Welcome back. Take Action News, final hour for the weekend. I'm Carl Frisch, all weekend. Uh, more about me at carlfrisch.com. Sign up for my email list. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Carl Frisch and connect with the show, takeactionnews.com. So as we do every week, uh, we want to check in with our good friend, the Democratic consultant and city Katie column, columnist, Jason Stanford, about some of the craziest things Texans have said this week. And each week, it gets harder and harder to whittle down the list. Jason, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, this is really becoming a coveted title because I can see the Republicans down here competing for it with ever more fervor. Well, it's not, even, it's not even just Republicans that are in office anymore. Uh, the first contender this weekend is one Tom DeLay, the former, uh, former majority leader of the House of Representatives, who really tried to do a huge dive off the top boards uh, this week. And it's such a gutsy, dark horse move. I mean, he's only 5'6", he weighs about 250. I mean, really not the kind of contender we were expecting this week, but he showed up big when he said that God is calling him to what he called, quote, a constitutional revival. So who called him to Dancing with the Stars? Would that be God. Satan? No, no, I think that was just a producer. Okay. Yes. Uh, so he's being called to a constitutional revival. Does that mean he's switching parties and becoming a constitutional progressive who actually believes in the text and history of the Constitution having a progressive vision? Uh, no, no. Actually, I think it means he just wants people to give him money so that he can talk. Oh. Can talk. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason he made number three this week is not because he's suddenly relevant, uh, thank God, but it's because he said, I'm not advocating for a revolution in the streets, but if that's what it takes. Dot, dot, dot. So yeah. if that's what it takes, then yes? 
that's what he leaves hanging out there. And there is never more a fearsome street fighter than a 62-year-old man who's had two facelifts. I really think I would not want to meet him in a dark alley. He was a former pest inspe- you know, pest exterminator. He knows more things about killing bugs than anyone ever. No. Well, when your best yeah. friends are cockroaches, this is what happens. Now, one thing I will say about Tom DeLay um, is that he should not be you know, underestimated. He's One of the reasons that Republicans are where they are and how they are right now is because of Tom DeLay. He was just out, forced out before he could see it all come to fruition. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the interesting thing to me is that he says he wants to have a constitutional revival, that God's calling him to one, and then he's talking about basically armed insurrection. And yeah. anybody who studied the Constitution and what our framers and founders had in mind knows that the Second Amendment had nothing to do with taking up arms against the government. Also, they have this thing that they do where you can overthrow the government. It's called elections. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's already something built in for that, uh, you know, and they keep trying to keep so voting. It's just a weird little hiccup. Here's you know, how it works then, Jason. Isn't their bag. It's uh, their thing. Here's how it works. The demographics that are growing fastest turn against you, so you change the rules and gerrymander your way into more sustainable majorities. And then when you start screwing the pooch so hard that it looks like even those advantages won't be able to save your, your butts, you start talking about armed insurrection. It's just absolutely fascinating. Uh, and number two on your list. Uh, number two on that list is a perennial favorite, always a contender, Steve Stockman, the East Texas uh, congressman out there. He was a congressman in the 90s. He was so then. crazy in the 90s that he, he came in with the Republican president. Revolution in 1994 and yeah. was elected out in 1996. Yeah. They turned around and said, oh, my God, I can't believe we elected you. We have to get rid of you. A man before his times. Now he's in the mainstream of the party. So this week he kind of did something that's normal for him, but it really should be recognized as colossally stupid. He circulated articles of impeachment to every uh, member of the House of Representatives, even the Democrats who think he's an idiot, and also the Republicans who think he's an idiot, to be fair. Um, and that should just be Tuesday for him. But my favorite, the reason he made the list this week is because one of the articles is that Obamacare is unconstitutional. He might find some disagreement with this uh, from the U.S. Supreme Court, who said it's constitutional. Again, yeah, but what's uh, checks and ba- you know checks and balances when we're among friends? Exactly, exactly. Checks and balances are just making sure that you you know don't bounce a check. Now this is an improvement, isn't it, Steve Stockman, who? A couple months ago, said, "Look, uh, yeah, we should have articles of impeachment, but uh, you know, we don't have a high crime or misdemeanor here, so we'd have to convince the media." Yes, so I think he's uh, he's going all in on stupid. He's not holding back. I think this shows real commitment to the craft. We really got to watch this guy. He's going to be a contender every single week. Um, and you know, what's the likelihood that he could possibly lose a seat anytime soon, like he did in '96? I don't think so. I think that, uh, I think it would take an uprising of sane people who are uh, horribly in short supply in that area of Texas. Um, well, that's unfortunate. Is it the same district that he was in before? It's real, real close to it. It's real close. It's uh, drawn. Uh, he won originally the old Jack Brooks seat, which includes uh, the Golden Triangle, Janis Joplin's home country, where Jerry, uh, J- uh, the um, geez, the old qu- Cowboys uh, coach, who's now a football analyst with that crazy silver hair. Anyway, a lot of sane people, a lot of Democrats, a lot of black folks, a lot of union folks are there. That's where he was elected when he beat Jack Brooks for the gun vote. His district now cuts out most of that. It's just really rural white people who hate uh, America and Obama. Well, they should they should love this kind of talk then. Oh, yeah. Um, right you know, a lot of these folks don't even know that the Supreme Court said that Obamacare was constitutional. Uh, yes. You know, you look at public polling, a lot of them think they actually ruled it unconstitutional. A lot of them think that it was never actually passed or signed by the president. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's fascinating. Um, it's when you ask a Texas Republican, well, what do you want uh, in health care reform? And they start listing all of the attributes of Obamacare. It's really my favorite thing now. All right. So who's coming in at number three this week? Number three. This guy really should be a contender every week. He had blue chip written all over him. When he got into Congress, we haven't seen the performance from him. What I'm seeing right now from Blake Farenhold is what I've been looking for him from from him forever now. He so he was talking to retired veterans. What did he say? He said, I feel like my, there were retired veterans who were worried that their checks weren't going to come because of the government shutdown. Right. What he told the media was, and this is a direct quote, unfortunately, I feel like my mandate when I was elected was to go to reduce the size of government, lower taxes, and increase freedom. 
and freedom isn't free. And sometimes you have to make a small sacrifice to move forward with what you're after. Well, I suppose it is a small sacrifice when it isn't what you're using to live off of. Exactly. It's a small sacrifice for him. And if, it's not like we've really asked veterans for all that much recently. Well, tell you know. me again why there was any debate over as to who wanted the government shutdown to happen. I don't know. It's because, really, we caught them and they screamed bloody murder that it wasn't them. Well, sometimes people that are not Texans make your list of uh, crazy comments. I'm surprised that the Congresswoman, Michelle Bachman, uh, who, you know, was screaming uh, off the microphones of the House of Representatives about um, the Illuminati being in charge and there being no... Actually, I'm hearing from a producer in my ear right now that that was not Michelle Bachman saying that they needed to serve God and that the Illuminati was in charge of our government, that it was, in fact, a uh, stenographer. Uh, my pardon. <laughs> pardon my confusion. <laughs> yes, stenographers don't get to make the list. They were just She seemed like a Republican me. member of Congress. Yes, that's the problem. Do you ever go to the Daily Current? It looks like the actual news. It is the most effective satire ever. I'm the only person who is, that I know of that has not fallen for that. Oh, it's so embarrassing. It is, yeah. It, it's always good Daily for a laugh. Current. People should check it out, dailycurrent.com. Oh. Jason, uh, what about Ted Cruz? Did he say anything crazy this week? He said he doesn't like avocados. None of us can figure that down here. Uh, and he's Cuban? Uh, yeah. Hmm. yeah. And this is Texas. Guacamole is what we feed to our babies here. I mean, it's good for you. So everyone's a little weirded out about him right now. Also came out this week that you know he's running. he was going to shut down the government, going to crash the economy. His wife works for Goldman Sachs. No one can quite figure out what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> uh, next thing you know, he'll be denying the other half of his heritage and saying that he doesn't like maple syrup on his waffles. Yes, but he'll be very, very polite about that, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jason Stanford, Democratic consultant, uh, syndicated columnist. Look forward to chatting with you again next week. Thanks, Carl. All righty. This is Take Action News. When we come back, uh, we're going to dig in a little bit and have a conversation with uh, our good friends at Human Rights Watch about a new report that says uh, drone attacks could be a war crime. Uh, you won't want to miss it. We'll be talking to Letta Taylor. Uh, so stick around and we'll be back after this. Michelle Garcia served meritoriously in Iraq and has the medals to prove it. Soon after leaving the Navy, Lieutenant Chris Scott found a job, a home, and started a family of his own. Corpsman Richard Stokely took the skills he learned in Vietnam and put them to good use as a paramedic. But soon after leaving the military, each of these veterans fell on hard times and faced homelessness. Even after Michelle lost all her savings, even after Chris wasn't able to pay his mortgage, and even after Richard battled alcoholism for years, they each reached out for help when they needed it most. A simple phone call put them in touch with a trained professional from the Department of Veterans Affairs. That call got Michelle a place to stay until she could afford one of her own, put Chris in touch with employment assistance, and found Richard a substance abuse program. These veterans are success stories not only for how they were able to help others while serving their country, but for how they were able to let others help them. If you know of or are a veteran in need, make the call. When you go on a road trip, you're careful. You follow the signs to arrive at the right place. It's the same online. Read the internet signs along the way, where you may be led astray. For example, look for the .gov at the end of the web address. If it isn't .gov, it isn't the real Social Security website. People are often victimized by misleading advertisers who use terms like Social Security or Medicare to trick the public. These companies charge a fee for free Social Security services. These services include changing your name and getting a new Social Security card. There's no need to pay for services Social Security offers for free. Go to www.socialsecurity.gov. And remember, if it isn't .gov, it isn't Social Security. Would you like to secure stable employment, affordable, high-quality child care, or an opportunity to serve your community through meaningful volunteer and internship experiences? If so, UPO is the place for you. Hello, I'm Andrea Thomas, Vice President of Administration and Chief of Staff for UPO. As the Community Action Agency for Washington, D.C., 
UPO has proudly served the residents of Washington for the past 50 years. Annually, we impact the lives of nearly 100,000 Washingtonians, 100,000 people advancing their education, securing employment, maintaining housing stability, and investing in their communities through volunteerism. Our vision is a Washington of thriving communities and self-sufficient residents. To learn more about our services and how you can partner with us or donate, visit us at www.upo.org. UPO, where we are uniting people with opportunities. Hank Action News is proud to be sponsored by Healthcare for America Now. HCAN is a national coalition of more than 1,000 groups in 50 states representing 30 million people. HCAN works to promote, defend, implement, and improve the Affordable Care Act at both the state and federal levels. They also try to protect Medicare and Medicaid, increase corporate accountability, and confront forces that seek to take away critical services. HCAN believes in creating jobs, not cutting programs people depend on. HCAN runs comprehensive issue campaigns that mobilize people at the grassroots and define the public debate. HCAN is fighting to protect, implement, and improve the new health care law through national and state-based legislative and regulatory campaigns built on grassroots action, public education, communications, policy analysis, and groundbreaking research. HCAN has become a respected voice and national leader on health care while continuing to focus on aggressive field activity. Support HCAN, Healthcare for America Now. Welcome back to Take Action News. I'm Carl Frisch all weekend. Uh, U.S. officials responsible for the secret CIA drone campaign against suspected terrorists in Pakistan uh, may have committed war crimes and should stand trial, according to a report by a leading human rights group, uh, the Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Uh, there's this great piece in The Guardian about this report, and I wanted to chat with Letta Taylor. She's a senior researcher on terrorism and counterterrorism at Human Rights Watch, and she joins us now. Letta, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on the show. All right, so walk us through this. I mean, it's very hard um, to determine uh, because so few people are willing to talk about these things and because uh, we have to be mindful that folks on the ground could be using it to you know, uh, build political pressure or to silence, you know, uh, political dissidents. So it's a painstaking process that must be undertaken to determine whether these attacks amount to war crimes or what exactly happened. Walk us through how that's done. Yeah, well, first, just to clarify, there's two reports that were launched jointly by uh, Amnesty International on Pakistan and by Human Rights Watch. That's the report I researched and authored on uh, attacks, mostly drone, but also other attacks in Yemen. Right. So they're slightly different scenarios. I can talk about both, but I'll, I'll talk specifically about my research. Yeah, let's stick and, as much to yeah. Yemen as we can. Yep. Okay, uh, they're, they're equally uh, of concern uh, to us. In terms of uh, my research, I look that uh, the U.S. has carried out about an estimated 80 drone strikes uh, and other targeted killings in Yemen since 2009. So that's all under the watch of President Obama, uh, and uh, who promised a clean slate after coming to office after President George W. Bush. Uh, what we found in these six strikes uh, was that despite assurances from President Obama that the U.S. is doing all it can to protect civilians from harm and that there are just that it's extremely rare that civilians are killed that indeed the US has killed innocent people in these strikes in in the in the studies I looked at uh, dozens if not more were killed and that's just six cases now I'm not saying that because dozens were killed in the six strikes I looked at that there aren't necessarily genuine uh, combatants with al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula who are killed uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is the Yemen based branch of al-Qaeda and the one the U.S. considers uh, uh, to be the most active. Uh, but nevertheless, these are clear examples of strikes uh, where innocent people have been killed, and the U.S. is simply not acknowledging them. It's as if the hundreds of Yemenis killed in these ta attacks wrongfully or uh, because they were legitimate targets simply didn't exist. Simply by existing, they become the target in essence. I mean, this is where we've, we've heard a lot of uh, discussions in the, in the media, probably not enough discussions, about how the government will reclassify people simply by their proximity to alleged terrorists. 
Well, this is the thing. We're not actually sure if they reclassify. I mean, I certainly can't. I'm not in a position to say that the right. government knows somebody. Which is part of the problem, right? It's, yeah. it's the lack of openness and accountability that leads to these questions. Exactly. We do not know such basic information as how many strikes has the U.S. really carried out? We're basing our estimates on groups that track this through media reports. We don't know that. We don't know how many people it's killed. We don't know how many it classifies as combatants who are legitimate targets and now how many it classifies as civilians. And whether those classifications change from incident to incident. And Exactly. And we also don't know, uh, getting back to one of your earlier points, uh, if the U.S. is looking at a strike after it happens. Let's say there's a strike in... Um, um, Okay, there's there's a strike that I looked at where t uh, 12 civilians were killed. Uh, the U.S. targeted a van. It turned out that all uh, 12 civilians inside, none of them was the target who was nowhere in sight. All of them were uh, farmers, women and children coming home from market. Their bodies are found scattered all over the road, charred in pieces and dusted with flour and sugar. Okay, the U.S. is not going to say those were militants. It right. can't say that. But let's say you have a similar um, strike on a van. Uh, and um, let's say some of the guys in that van are also coming home from market and bringing food, hope from food home. But let's say they also have guns, and let's say that, um, uh, yeah, let's just say they have guns and that they're of fighting age. The U.S. may, in its what they call post-strike assessment, just say, okay, those are guys, they're young, they've got guns, we're going to put them in the militant right. category rather than the civilian category. But in Yemen... Yemen's the most heavily armed country in the world except for one country, which is the United States. Right. Um, every guy in Yemen practically carries a gun and a dagger. It's a very tribal society. That doesn't mean that they're out uh, to get the United States. It means that's what they do. So um, to categorize them as combatants when they may just be civilians with guns is uh, is a very dangerous uh, system if indeed that's what's happening. We don't know for sure that's what's happening, but we have serious questions about that. And that's one of the reasons we want to see the data. We want to see who the U.S. is putting in what category and why. And we want them to then investigate. And if they find that, that, that strikes are unlawful, we want people held accountable. Well, especially, and paid. especially yeah. after we were told by the president that there'd be more accountability and uh, uh, openness when it comes to the drones, even even if just inside the legislative body. I mean, it's not often that the president of the United States makes, um, you know, comments specific to these issues of executive power. But he did. And he did it this year. And it's as if the media has already forgotten about those comments uh, and were relegated to not talking about uh, these issues again for another couple of years. Well, it's interesting because, in fact, uh, the president's comments, I think, uh, were the result of mounting pressure. Right. Um, and, uh, in fact, then nine drone strikes uh, took place in Yemen uh, right after his speech. Uh, and there was the same level of uh, silence about what exactly went on. We we're all left to, to try to figure it out through media reports, several of which suggested that the new tough guidelines uh, on targeted killings to s ensure they protected civilians had actually been disregarded, just tossed aside during these nine strikes. So if it's a new policy that then is disregarded any time the nation feels un under threat, well, that's not a new policy. Right. But I would, yeah, but I would say that I, I would beg to differ on the issue of this being forgotten. Uh, our two reports that were, were launched this week by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch um, ha got massive media attention. We got a, a, a top-placed um, op -ed, editorial, I should say, in the New York Times. Uh, media around the world have been covering this. Uh, in addition, two, and, two UN investigators, special invest investigators, presented findings also questioning targeted killings at the United Nations General Assembly just this morning. And several delegates, several representatives of countries, uh, and the representative of the... Uh, European Union questioned the program also. So I think there is mounting pressure. It's certainly progress. I think overall, I would say that issues of executive power do not get the attention they deserve. I mean, you go back and look at the 2008 and 2012 elections, hardly a single question is about uh, a single question about executive power in any of the presidential debates, <clears throat> which is why it's so important when groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International produce these reports that they get the attention they deserve 
and why we've been happy to have you on the show. Uh, Letta Taylor, Senior Researcher, Terrorism and Counterterrorism at Human Rights Watch. Uh, where can folks find the report and read more about it? Yes, it's at uh, www.hrw.org, and the report is called Between uh, a Drone and Al-Qaeda, because that's how many Yemenis feel. Right. Uh, absolutely. Excellent work. Uh, we look forward to chatting again soon. Thanks so much. We'll keep on the pressure on the administration on All this. All right. When we come back, we're going to be chatting with our good friends at Amnesty International about their report on this subject. Uh, and we'll dig a little bit deeper into the overall issue, um, beginning to sense a trend here that it's like a balloon. Um, the pressure builds, and then the administration or Congress will say something to let the pressure out. And then the pressure builds back up, and then we have to deflate the balloon again instead of just popping the balloon and coming to some kind of consensus on what is allowed and what is not allowed. So when we come back on Take Action News, we're going to be chatting with Noreen Shah. She's an advocacy advisor at Amnesty International, so stick around. You won't want to miss it. You're listening to We At Radio, WPWC 1480 AM. Now get out there and do something. Breast health awareness is critical for all women, particularly African Americans, because we have an increased risk of dying from breast cancer compared to women of other backgrounds. At U of M, I'm doing research here and with women in Ghana to look for an inherited link that makes African and African American women susceptible to a more aggressive type of cancer. Finding this link, I believe, will make new treatments possible. But right now, making sure that you are properly screened is our best protection. With experts like Dr. Lisa Newman, the University of Michigan Health System is a leader in cancer care. When you call our free Cancer Answer line at 800-865-1125, an oncology nurse will answer any questions you might have about the prevention, screening, and treatment of breast cancer and other forms of cancer. All calls are confidential. Call 800-865-1125 or visit uofmhealth.org slash cancer answer line. We're working to help everyone enjoy longer, healthier lives. That's the Michigan difference. As a National Guard or Reserve member, you served your country. Now let VA serve you. I wouldn't be here today as a successful woman without the help that I received. Your VA honors your service by providing a wide range of veterans' benefits. From home loans to job training, VA benefits can help with some of life's toughest challenges. What's important about VA benefits is they don't, don't just touch you as an individual. They can touch your parents, maybe your grandparents, your child. Go to benefits.va.gov slash guard reserve to learn more, including how to apply online using eBenefits. I just finished a master's degree recently, and now I'm working on another degree as well. So the military made that all possible. My veterans' benefits made that all possible. No matter what the time is, apply for your benefits. You earn them. VA is ready to help you. Achieve your next mission. Learn about and apply for your VA benefits today. Hey, I'm Anderson Cooper. As a parent, you want to make sure that your child knows how to deal with bullying when they see it happening. And chances are they want to help, but they don't really know how. I'll teach them that the best thing to do is calmly walk away, find a teacher or other adult, and speak up. And do your part. Be that adult they can talk to and trust will listen. Join me to help stop bullying. Go to stopbullying.gov to find out more. True definition of hero and been a hero. Took a heroic effort. Every day we bring to our fans the world of sports. We speak of heroes and heroism, but there are days when sports matter little and heroes matter more. These heroes don't hit walk-off homers or buzzer-beating threes. They simply made a plan for what to do when disaster strikes. You never know when you might need to be the hero because you never know if today is the day before a natural disaster. Prepare, plan, be a hero. Visit ready.gov. Hey there, Matthew Filipovich here, host of the creatively titled Matthew Filipovich Show, which, by the way, you can hear every single Saturday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. right here on 1480 a.m. We Act Radio. Now, I'm going to be honest with you people. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but... 
but I like talking to smart people, people who are smarter than me, some of the smartest, funniest, most badass progressives out there, people like Glenn Greenwald, Naomi Klein, Jank Uger of the Young Turks, Jamie Kilstein, Allison Kilkenny, Alan Grayson, Jeremy Scahill, Jim Hightower, and more. That's right, I said more. Don't believe me? Well, tune in to the Matthew Filipovich Show every single Saturday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. for some of the best in liberal talk, news, comedy, and interviews right here on 1480 a.m. We Act Radio. Welcome back. This is Take Action News all weekend. I'm Carl Frisch. We're continuing our conversation about new reports concerning the drone programs by this administration, the Obama administration, and whether or not they rise to the level of war crimes. Um, some debate about that. But also, more specifically, um, whether or not the president and his administration is living up to his words uh, following the controversy several months ago when he said that they'd be more open and accountable uh, and provide more checks and balances when it comes to our drones program. Uh, joining us now to chat about this is Noreen Shah. She is an advocacy advisor at Amnesty International, and they've got a new report out as well. Uh, Noreen, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, I, I was just talking with uh, our good friends at Human Rights Watch uh, about their report. Uh, you all came to similar findings. And the painstaking nature that one must take when... Uh, conducting these reports, because on both sides, you've got an administration that isn't providing information. Um, and on the other side, you've got uh, folks who may have uh, a political reason for claiming uh, that, you know, innocent people have been hurt. So uh, Amnesty International takes great pains to get to the bottom of what exactly happens in these situations. It's very difficult, right? It is. But, you know, what Amnesty was able to do in the handful of cases that we document in this report is send in multiple teams to interview eyewitnesses, corroborate uh, eyewitness accounts with, um, in some cases, video of the areas where the drone strikes occurred, uh, satellite imagery, uh, and also by speaking to medical doctors uh, who uh, live in the area, we were able to come to strong conclusions about potential unlawful killings. So ultimately, under international law, and really as a moral matter, it's up to the U.S. government to respond to the evidence and to say what happened in these cases. Well, and they've obviously been very tight-lipped about that. And to that end, you've got this uh, op-ed at The Guardian um, that talks about the president's promises from May, um, you know, the last time these issues concerning drones really uh, were heating up uh, in the national media, and the president made his remarks about the need for more accountability, uh, more checks and balances, um, and a more stringent use of, of some kind of rules to make sure that innocent people aren't killed, and, and your contention that there's been an escalation and that the very things that were talked about in May are not being followed. Right. So President Obama, about half a year ago, made a pledge of increasing transparency on U.S. drone strikes, and that was in the aftermath of a filibuster by Senator Rand Paul right. and a lot of congressional attention to the issue. But the reality is that since that speech that President Obama made in May, uh, we haven't seen any new disclosures by the administration about who is being killed, uh, how many people have been killed, and what the factual and legal basis for these uh, killings are. Well, and to that end, um, what would Amnesty International like to see the administration do? Uh, obviously, they're not going to be forthcoming with every piece of information that, that we'd like them to be. Uh, so that these things could be checked out and verified. Uh, but short of that, what can the administration be doing to be a more honest broker in this situation? Well, what we're calling on President Obama to do is immediately investigate or commit to investigating these cases. You know, one uh, uh, strange peculiarity of the drone strikes that we're seeing in Pakistan is that they're conducted by the CIA. They're not, as far as we know, directed by the U.S. military. And as such, the U.S. military's rules... Uh, including rules that would require it to investigate credible allegations of civilian deaths, uh, might not even be applying to uh, the drone strikes that were happening in Pakistan. So we uh, find that discrepancy really disturbing. I mean, it's the, the case that if you were killed by a drone strike 
uh, in Afghanistan, you might be able to get some recourse. You might be able to get an investigation, some dignification of what happened to you across the border in Pakistan. And all that happens is, uh, you know, your family member is killed by a drone and you never receive any explanation whatsoever. Well, and towards that end, there's uh, this report about uh, a Pakistani drone victim's lawyer being refused access to the United States uh, in apparently an effort to block his ability to go tell Congress what happened. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that, uh, that Pakistani lawyer is a predicament. I mean, I think the larger issue is that the U.S. government has obligations to tell the public and to tell members of Congress what's going on in the drone campaign. Uh, ultimately, it's not about um, us at, human right, or at Amnesty International or uh, any given lawyer. It's about what the U.S. government uh, has obligations to do. It's got to be more transparent. That's under international law, uh, something they have responsibility for. And, you know, what's happening now is that the government is talking the talk of openness and transparency, but not following that up with actual actions to declassify uh, these killings and explain what's going on. Now, I realize that Amnesty International is uh, a human rights organization, international, uh, and really doesn't delve into uh, partisan politics. But one thing that absolutely drives me crazy, so in 2008, uh, during the primary debates for president, uh, Republican side, several dozen debates, Democratic side, lots of debates as well. And in all of those debates and the general election debates between McCain and Barack Obama, not a single question was asked of the candidates about executive power. Um, and when not a single question is asked, you certainly can't dig very deep to get their thinking on these issues or get them on the record before they seek office in any other way than maybe a policy paper might say. Um, what can people be doing? And it was very similar in 2012, by the way, on the Republican side, when they had their open field of candidates. What can people be doing to bring these issues of executive power or the lack of a constitutional authority um, to the forefront? In, in you know, 2016 is going to be another election cycle with dozens of candidates out there not talking about executive power. Noreen? Sorry about that. Uh, we're not only calling on President Obama to investigate these cases, we're also asked calling on Congress to do its part. The Congressional Intelligence and Armed Services Committees have jurisdiction over drone strikes in Pakistan and Yemen. Uh, they have a relationship uh, with the CIA, and the reality is, is that they ought to be looking into these drone strikes and finding out what's going on. And they can't just take President Obama's word. For right. I, I don't disagree with that in the slightest, but I'll return to my question. How can we make sure that these types of issues, when it comes to drones and executive power and constitutional authority, how can we make sure that these issues are issues that are discussed when we're choosing our leaders? Because as it stands right now, the issues hardly ever come up on the campaign trail. Yeah, it's something that's a disturbing trend in U.S. politics. Uh, the idea that the U.S. public does not actually care about what the U.S. government is doing around the world. I think the fundamental problem with drone strikes is not just that, uh, you know, there's lack of investigations, which is what we're focused on because of the cases that we're looking at, but also that the U.S. government believes that it can deploy military force around the world without actually getting the active consent of the American people. It's a problem from the perspective of democratic accountability as well as in, term of hu in terms of human rights. Well, and hopefully in 2016, um, especially after the last, uh, you know, 16 years, uh, folks will take the issue seriously as they decide who they're going to choose. Um, and uh, folks have got to read these special reports from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Where can folks find this great report from, from your organization? amnestyusa.org slash drones, and you can also send a letter to President Obama and to your members of Congress asking them to investigate the case of the killing of a 68-year-old grandmother and a 14-year-old boy. And they can do that at the same website, right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Noreen Shah, she's an advocacy advisor at Amnesty International. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And you can follow her on Twitter as well. Really great tweets, uh, Noreen Shah, uh, at Noreen Shah, rather. Uh, when we come back, there's been big developments all week long when it comes to marriage equality. Uh, New Jersey uh, joins us as the next state allowing such unions, and it brings us to a grand total of one out of every three Americans living in a state where marriage equality is the law of the land. Stick around. We're going to be chatting with Chris Geidner from BuzzFeed.
me, guns are for hunting and protecting my family. I believe in the Second Amendment and I'll fight to protect it. But with rights come responsibilities. That's why I support comprehensive background checks so criminals and the dangerously mentally ill can't buy guns. That protects my rights and my family. Tell Congress, don't protect criminals. Vote to protect gun rights and our families with comprehensive background checks. Demand action now. Hello, everybody. I'm David Schuster, your host of Take Action News. On our show, we talk government, politics, and what you can do to have an impact. We're nonpartisan, report like hell, and let the chips fall where they may. We feature segments like social media, activists of the week, and the latest news affecting our communities. So join us every Saturday and make a difference. Yes, you and I, we can do this. That's Take Action News on the air, online, and at your podcast convenience on iTunes each week on the We Act Radio Network. Say you want to go to college. Yay! A Big Ten college. <laughs> but you don't want to feel like part of the, well, you know. Is there an answer for you? Of course. Indiana University East. Go Rebels! Indiana University East. You'll get the quality of a Big Ten education in a small college setting. IU East offers more than 50 fields of study, from accounting to political science, taught by internationally recognized faculty with an average of 18 students per class. So it's not... Student number 95A-6273, please report to... It's more like... Hey, John, welcome to class. Best of all, you'll graduate with one of the most respected degrees anywhere, a degree from IU. Don't wait. Go to iue.edu... Or call 800-959-EAST to arrange a visit to Indiana University East. IU. Focused on you. We Act Radio is a very proud partner of the Start at Westminster, a harm reduction, prevention, and awareness initiative sponsored by the Westminster Presbyterian Church right here in D.C. Start stands for syringe, treatment, advocacy, resources, training. These are the core elements of the harm reduction philosophy at Start. The goal of this program is to reduce transmissions of HIV, hepatitis, and other blood-borne infectious diseases by empowering those at risk of infection with the tools, resources, and referrals they need to take charge of their health. Over the past year, the Start at Westminster tested over 1,600 people, and they're averaging about 150 tests each month. And of course, with the proper funding, that number could go even higher. For more information on this terrific program, go to www.startatwestminster.org. Or visit the Westminster Presbyterian Church, 400 I Street Southwest, right here in Washington, D.C. 100% success rate in notifying your consultation at 10%. Does this sound familiar? If you're in need of assistance with your mortgage, be careful where you turn for help. Loan modification scammers will offer deals too good to be true. Learn the signs so your life won't be turned upside down. Know it, avoid it, report it. For more information or to report a scam, call 1-888-995-HOPE or visit HUD.gov slash prevent loan scams. Our children are exposed to violence every day in their neighborhoods, in their schools, even in their own homes. Exposure to violence can have a devastating and lifelong impact. Through community action and leadership at the national level, we're identifying the children who need our help. I'm Attorney General Eric Holder, and I'm asking those of you who have a role in a child's life to take action. Through your attention and early intervention, we can help children in need to heal, to thrive. Together, we can change their lives and their futures. Join the Justice Department in defending childhood. Welcome back. Take Action News, our final segment for the weekend. I'm Carl Frisch. As always, more about me at carlfrisch.com. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Carl Frisch. And connect with the show at takeactionnews.com. As you likely heard this week, marriage equality is coming to the state of New Jersey as Chris Christie has decided not to challenge a Supreme Court decision to lift a stay, uh, uh, to not have a stay on marriage equality uh, in New Jersey. But before we bring in Chris Geidner from BuzzFeed, uh, for my straight brothers and sisters out there, I must remind you that marriage equality is not the only issue where LGBT people are not equal. Just so you know, uh, LGBT people can only be legally married in 13, uh, 14 states and D.C. Um, they can be denied a job for being gay in 29 states. 
They can deny a lease for an apartment or a small business in 32 states. Their kids can be discriminated against uh, in uh, 30 states for being gay in their public schools. Uh, They can be denied a joint adoption of their children uh, in 32 states. Um, And, you know, it's even worse for transgender people. So as we uh, get into this conversation, as we close out the show on the issue of marriage equality, it's important to remember uh, that LGBT people have a lot of ground that they need to make up in order to be fully equal uh, and considered uh, of the right to simple human dignity. Chris Geidner, uh, the legal editor at BuzzFeed, joins us now. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Carl. All right. So New Jersey. I want to get into New Jersey and then do a quick recap of all the other states. Things are moving very fast out there, yes, uh, to say the least. Uh, but Chris Christie decided not to appeal a decision. And therefore, now we have marriage equality in New Jersey? Um, More or less. (laughs) Um, It it was a a, a quick few weeks of movement. Back on uh, September 27th, a trial judge had ruled that the state's civil unions were no longer sufficient at giving uh, same-sex couples in the state equal rights since the U.S. Supreme Court back in June changed the law effectively by eliminating the prohibition on the federal government recognizing same-sex couples' marriages by striking down DOMA. Because of that, couples in New Jersey with marriages uh, are effectively able to get more rights. And so, therefore, the civil unions uh, basically prevented same-sex couples in New Jersey from having the same rights as couples who had um, marriages. Um, and so the, the trial court judge made that decision, put, said that the ruling would go into effect on October 21st and allowed the state time to uh, try to appeal the decision or to put the ruling in effect. And what ended up happening was that they did try to appeal and they did try to hold, put her ruling on hold while they appealed, but the trial court judge first denied that attempt at a stay, and then uh, on the Friday before the 21st, the state Supreme Court said, yeah, we agree with the trial court judge, we're not going to keep the the ruling on uh, hold while we consider your appeal, and so therefore marriages began at 12.01 a.m. Monday morning. Then, as the, the... light broke on New Jersey that day. The Christie administration announced that they were going to withdraw their appeal of the, uh, the the trial court ruling, and that effectively ended the debate in New Jersey over whether or not uh, there would be same-sex couples with equal marriage rights. Well, and now we look to a variety of other states. I'll, I'll name some of them. Michigan, Nevada, Illinois, New Mexico, Hawaii, uh, Virginia, um, and all sorts of other places. Where do we go from here? Which which state do you want to pick off the list? Um, well, Hawaii, Illinois, and New Mexico are, are the, the three that could happen by the end of the year. Um, the Illinois uh, legislature is in the midst of a veto session. They have finished the first of two weeks of sort of a, an end-of-the-year session of the legislature. And uh, advocates are, are pushing, and the, the state senator, the, the state rep who is leading the bill, uh, Representative Harris, ha- has said that uh, they will be, be bringing the marriage equality bill forward. There are questions about whether or not they have the votes, which was the same problem uh, that they had in the spring. And um, the, there, there's going to be some real pressure for the, the last week of that special session, which is the first week of November, uh, whether or not they move forward. Um, in uh, Hawaii, on the other hand, people are, are fairly confident it's, it's going to get done and happen. And they also have a special session, and the special session is going to begin October 28th. As if, and it didn't take that long. I mean, what's it been, 20 years since Hawaii yeah, kicked I mean, off the Hawaii fight for marriage equality? Where it, where it all began back in, in, in 93. Um, but the... the the, the legislature, they have civil unions, and 
the the governor uh, Neil Abercrombie called for a special session that is only for marriage equality. Whereas in Illinois, there are some some other issues relating to the budget, relating to pensions that that are also being considered. But this special session in Hawaii is just for marriage equality legislation, and it is expected to pass in New Mexico. The state Supreme Court this week heard oral arguments over whether or not uh, the the state should be allowing same-sex couples. Well, and that's an interesting, New Mexico is an interesting one because it neither had laws sanctioning marriage equality, nor did it have any prohibition of marriage equality. So it was kind of a limbo area. The state remaining that fits into that category. It has no ban either in, in statute or amendment, and it also does not allow marriage equality. And so the the justices, the five justices of the state Supreme Court, heard a, a series of oral arguments on on the the state statutes in New Mexico, on the state's equal protection law, and on the state also has an equal rights amendment uh, based on sex. Um, and they are uh, going to to take that into consideration. Now, keep in mind, New Mexico is the state where several county clerks either on their own. Uh, volition or under court order have already started marrying same-sex couples. So, so what uh, what's the political makeup of the court, and is that having any impact on what people think well, is going to happen? I mean, I can tell you that the the justices were were very responsive to the arguments. I I think that it, it looks like they. Um, it, it would be more surprising if they did not go forward than if they did. Gotcha. And uh, where do we turn next? Maybe not this year, but, uh, you know, there's yeah, other... I mean, we, we have a series of cases. There are two different cases in Virginia that are in federal court. I mean, the thing about the New Mexico case is that it's just regarding state claims. Right. There's no federal claim. There, there's no claim that's similar to the, the Proposition 8 case that the U.S. Constitution requires uh, that same-sex couples be allowed to marry. And so the the issues in some other cases do raise that. There, there's two cases in Virginia. There's a case in Pennsylvania brought by the ACLU. There's a, a case in Michigan that is set for a, a February trial date. Um, there's uh, case in Hawaii, there's a case Arkansas in and Tennessee and Nevada. Well, the cases the the cases in Hawaii and Nevada are interesting because they are both at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Michigan case, if they have their their trial in February, could very quickly get to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And then these Virginia cases, they're they're hoping to resolve them uh, in, in summary judgment, which basically means before a trial, just based on the law. And if, if they do that in either of those cases, those could quickly go to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And basically what we're going to quickly see is a, a series of cases uh, on the, the fast track to go back to the Supreme Court, potentially. And uh, Chad now. Griffin, the, the head of Human Rights Campaign, promised folks that we'd have marriage equality in all 50 states within the next five years, certainly a way of doing it. And also on the list of marriage equality states, uh, Oregon this this past week uh, said that it will begin recognizing marriage, uh, same-sex marriages performed in other jurisdictions. Yeah, they, they will. They announced that they will do that. I'm sorry. The, nothing. They they announced that they will do that, and they also announced that they. I mean, advocates in the state are are well on their way to a 2014 ballot initiative that would allow not just the recognition of marriages, same-sex couples' marriages, but would actually bring marriage equality to the state. Well, and, you know, it's it's awfully nice to see the entire western seaboard recognizing marriage equality <laughs> um yeah, they, they like, like uh the the new england states that now all have marriage equality all of the the west coast states are now at least uh recognizing well and it seems like with each of these passing victories uh for the folks fighting for marriage equality public opinion tends to come along even further every time uh one of these things happens yeah, well, I mean, there there are more people each each week now who who know somebody who who is in a a, a marriage with a, another person of the same sex, and that that is is changing the dynamic. 
Well, and there certainly must be something said for the fact that lots of people, one third of all Americans now live in a state where uh, marriage equality is legal, and yet we have not slid into the ocean. Um, this is true. Not on <laughs> either coast or, or through by way of Iowa. <laughs> this is true. Uh, although if Iowa slid into the ocean, I mean, we'd, re- we'd really be in trouble. All the more d- d- dis- disalarming. Chris Geidner, legal editor at BuzzFeed. Thanks for checking in with us and getting us up to date on the marriage equality fight uh, across the country. This is Take Action News. We've had another great show, and I want to thank everybody, uh, Troy and Rachel and Melissa and Peter, who helped out on controls. And for all of us here at Take Action News, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Johnson, former governor of New Mexico. Last year, my state became the 12th state to allow medical use of marijuana by patients who are seriously ill. Some people were surprised that a Republican governor supports medical marijuana, but I'm hardly alone. Groups like the American College of Physicians, American Nurses Association, and American Public Health Association have all acknowledged the medical value of marijuana. New research about medical marijuana is coming out almost every day showing remarkable potential in all sorts of serious conditions, including cancer, AIDS, and chronic pain. But some in government still want to put politics and ideology ahead of public health. To learn more about medical marijuana and what you can do to help, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thanks. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC 1480 AM. Now get out there and do something. senior officials in the White House, State Department, and Pentagon to hand over their Rolodexes containing contact information for foreign leaders. The document shows that one unnamed official handed over 200 phone numbers, which included dozens of world leaders, so that the National Security Agency could spy on them. After the information became public, White House officials avoided discussing details of the program. Caitlin Hayden, National Security Council spokeswoman, said... The United States is not monitoring and will not monitor the communications of Chancellor Merkel. Beyond that, I'm not in a position to comment publicly on every specific alleged intelligence activity, end quote. Ms. Hayden did not confirm or deny that the U.S. had been monitoring the Chancellor or any other world leaders. Of course, these revelations will have a serious impact on diplomatic relations with Germany and other countries. Already, details of the U.S. spying have angered several nations, including Brazil and Mexico. And that list is going to grow quickly in the wake of this new information. At a press conference in Brussels, Chancellor Merkel said, spying among friends is not at all acceptable against anyone, and that goes for every citizen in Germany. That goes for every citizen and every leader in other nations as well. In screwed news, only a week after being hit with the biggest typhoon in a decade, Japan is already being slammed with another storm, and it's heading right for the crippled Fukushima.